Good morning. Good morning. We are going to get started in about four minutes. And I just wanted to advise you that we are also live streaming the event. So you are all famous and out there online. So I just wanted to give you that heads up. So we'll start in about five minutes. Thanks. Good morning again. <laughs> Good morning. Morning. Thank you. I appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. And welcome to the first ever Niagara Region Climate Change Summit. The summit is hosted by Niagara Region in partnership with Brock University and the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority. My name is Suzanne Matter. I'm the Manager of Corporate Performance and Strategy in the Corporate Strategy and Innovation Division at Niagara Region. And I lead the climate change file for the region. It is my honor and privilege to also be the MC for today's event. Today's theme is collaborating for a sustainable future. This summit is our first step in bringing together leaders from diverse sectors in the community to form partnerships, learn from each other, and find opportunities to accelerate climate change action in our community. As well, I would like to also welcome our live stream participants who are joining us online. Thank you for being here and sharing in our experience. As well, we are very jealous that you are in sweatpants and possibly comfy in a chair or on a couch. Um, we hope you are inspired by the speakers today. Thank you all for being here. I know this is different from what we've experienced over the last few years, but we very much appreciate all of you being here and joining in today. This is a very important and timely event for us. But before we begin the summit, I wanted to ask Chandra Sharma, the CAO from the Niagara Peninsula, Peninsula Conservation Authority, to say the land acknowledgement. Good morning. 
So on uh, behalf of Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority, Regional Municipality of Niagara, and Brock University, we acknowledge that this area is treaty lands steeped in the rich history of the Haudenosaunee, Adi Van Der Rock, and the Anishinaabe, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. There are many First Nations peoples, Métis citizens, and Inuit from across Turtle Island that live and work here today. We are committed to improving engagement with our local indigenous peoples, past and present, in the shared stewardship of the land on which we live. Thank you. Thank you, Chandra, for that. Now I would like to welcome Shkabe Dylan Ritchie, who will conduct a traditional indigenous opening for us today. Ani Bojo, Makdewa Baju Indigenous Cause Sagim Donj Daba Makwa Dodem. I come uh, from Sagim First Nations. Uh, my great grandfather came from Sagim First Nations, Fred Ritchie, and my great grandmother came from Shawanaga. So I come from the Lake uh, Huron, uh, Georgian Bay area. Uh, my clan is Bear Clan, and I, I'm going to open up in a way that I know how to, to honor to honor all you guys that sit here today. All right, so miigwech jam the do, gijam the do. You would name a na ma ba sama minwa o de wan an and bagim mangum. Miigwech nda misho mis minwa nok mis. Jinagu gan yajig, nangum and yajig, wa bangi and yajig. Miigwech noden, miigwech go de, miigwech, miigwech a ki, miigwech ni bi. Miigwech a giwede nang wabenang jamanang minwa pengish mak. Daga, we Wedoka, Wishanan, we Middle Bamadzuin, Aho, Miigwech. So, what I said there is uh, we offer today our, our hearts and our tobacco um, that we go today uh, forward, moving forward with, uh, with in that good minded way with our heart and uh, not our, in that way of thinking, especially when we're dealing with our, our Mother Earth here, Shkuk Mikwe. This is uh, our intention here today is to, to protect and talk about our Earth. And I think that's uh, uh, something that needs to be talked about more. And that is our first intention here for everybody that's on this earth is to take care of Mother Earth. So this is uh, something we need to look at is to, uh, to honor Mother Earth. And the way I do it is through prayer, through, through that talk, uh, through that gratitude. And I want to honor the Anishinaabe Haudenosaunee in this area that still honor that, that first intention from the, from the beginning of creation. And I, order, I, I said thank you to the four, four elements there, the wind, the earth, uh, the water, um, the, the fire, and the, uh, what's the, uh, <laughs> Nibi, um, Shkode, uh, Iki, and Noden, the wind, water, fire, earth, those elements anyways, they're, they're there for us to, to help us and to, uh, for our, uh, the directions too, the honor those directions, the doorways that we come into this earth from the eastern doorway and we leave in the west. Uh, so just honoring those directions and to also help us live in that good life, uh, what we said to please help us live in that good life because we are here as guests, we are here to help uh, each other, lift each other up in that good way. So uh, miigwech for everybody to listening to me uh, and letting me talk my language to you and what I know. Um, and. Uh, yeah, have a good day. Miigwech. Chi miigwech. Aho. Thank you very much, Dylan Ritchie from the Soggy and First Nation for sharing your words of welcome today. I believe that our intentions align. We are here to honor the earth and to work to collaborate and create partnerships in honoring those four elements. Next, we have Regional Chair Jim Bradley will provide some opening remarks for us this morning. Good morning, all. 
On behalf of Regional Council, I would like to thank each of you for being with us today, whether you're here in person or you're, you're here by Zoom. Uh, having over 100 of Niagara's leaders from municipal government, the private sector, academia, environmental protection, nonprofit organizations, and utilities is an estimate, uh, it certainly indicates very clearly to me and I think to all of us how important climate change is and the commitment to taking steps to address it. I also want to acknowledge those watching the summit online at home. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to participate in today's important session. As I say, they're in the enviable position of being able to be in uh, track pants and so on, and here we are all dressed up here, but uh, I want to uh, certainly welcome all of those who are watching us online. It goes without saying that climate change is one of the most pressing items facing our planet today. The effect of climate change impact is nearly every facet of our lives and is virtually inescapable. While we traditionally relate the impacts of climate change on things like melting ice caps and permafrost, and certainly rising sea levels, the issue is much more complex and much more widespread. From extreme weather events that cause billions in damage to private and public property, to oppressive drought threatening our food security and driving up prices, we cannot escape or deny that climate change has dramatically affected all of our lives. A 2020 report issued by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Insurance Bureau of Canada estimated that climate change will cost municipalities across the country $5.3 billion annually. While part of that cost is certainly driven by the direct effects on infrastructure, the report shows that climate change is making it more risky for municipalities to secure insurance, thereby driving up premiums, and these increased costs are paid for by taxpayers in our cities, towns, and villages. It's important also to remember that the private sector is certainly not immune to the impacts of climate change. A report released by the United Nations in 2019 estimated that 80 million jobs worldwide would be at risk to rising temperatures, say nothing of the potential uh, losses in productivity due to areas being unlivable and unworkable, and that is certainly not just a, a, uh, a threat out there. It is something that could really happen. Studies are also showing that even in a cooler, cooler country, such as Canada, the cost to cool our buildings and facilities will rise by more than 70% in the coming decades. With the cost of air conditioning far outpricing the cost of heating in the coming years. Outside of the environmental and financial impacts of climate, strange, strange, climate change, we need to consider the impacts of, of climate on our health and our well-being. Studies from the CDC demonstrate that climate change has the potential to increase the rates of affliction, such as malnutrition, asthma, cholera, mental health issues, malaria, Lyme disease, West Nile virus, and heart disease. And I, I ask you to think about this for a moment as well. How many of us, uh, I, uh, perhaps not with the uh, uh, youth who are here today, but how many of us ever thought we would see Lyme disease being uh, of significant here, or West Nile disease? That was always something that happened well south of Canada. And today it's a reality, uh, a sad reality for many people who've been afflicted with those diseases. So with the big picture in mind, we have a responsibility today. This summit is the, perhaps the first important step in our efforts to manage the impacts of climate change and do our part in limiting our emissions. As I stated, there are representatives from every sector across Niagara here today. We'll be hearing from numerous experts, all warning about the impacts of climate change and the best practices to help manage it. The research shows that addressing climate change will take all of us working together. It will take the private and public sector, the nonprofit organizations, and even individuals making significant changes in order to slow the increase in global temperatures. As regional chair, I'm well aware of the important role that municipalities play in the creation of greenhouse gas emissions. Studies again conducted by the Federation of Canadian Municipalities 
show that 50% of all emissions in Canada can be influenced by local government. When half the problem can be positively impacted by many of the people in this room, we cannot responsibly afford to ignore this issue. It is within our power to start taking the needed actions to slow the increase in global temperatures. The organizations, institutions, and municipalities we represent are not innocent bystanders. We must all commit to work together to make the changes and investments that are necessary before it is too late. But there is some good news. First, you're here today, which means you and your organizations care enough about this critical issue to start the conversation. You understand that we cannot ignore this problem and it's time to start taking collective responsibility and indeed in some cases we're all already beginning to do so. Second, it's important to remember that there's a strong return on investment when we choose to dedicate time and money to addressing climate change. Reports show that every dollar that is invested into climate change in the initiatives really ends up resulting in some six dollars in return. One dollar and six dollars. That's a substantial return on investment. When we consider that the impacts of climate change are not just environmental, the return on investment is an important figure to keep in mind. Third, we need to remind ourselves that we're in good company by starting this conversation. Thousands of communities, businesses and institutions around the world have signed on to formal agreements to limit their emissions. Well, I fully acknowledge that we may not be quite ready to sign on to an emissions target today, this summit is a crucial first step in the right direction. But make no mistake, Niagara, as compared to many of our counterparts across the world, has a lot of catching up to do. And it goes without saying this work will be difficult and require many strategic investments. I do not share these words to be an alarmist, but to ensure that we share the same sense of urgency. The rate of climate change we are seeing is directly related to human activity. We have the power to start making a difference here today. We simply cannot wait any longer. I invite you to take the messages we hear today seriously, and I know you will. Whether it's from our keynote speaker, uh, industry expert, or Niagara's youth, it's important to listen to all voices that are here today. I invite you to be active participants at the breakout groups this afternoon. These conversations will help form the basis of our plan to move together uh, and, and move together enthusiastically. And finally, I invite you to sign our call to action as a symbolic commitment to partnership, a recognition that we're all in this together and a pledge that we need to do better. Again, I want to thank each of you for being here today. Your attendance is important as we start this journey as a united community. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Bradley. Thank you for those words. And thank you to Regional Council for making this happen today, for prioritizing the Climate Change Summit and climate change. And thank you to all of the councillors, regional councillors and local councillors that are here today to show their leadership for our community. Now we're going to move on to our keynote speaker. Our keynote speaker today is Karen Farbridge. Karen leads Karen Farbridge and Associates, a consultancy based firm in Guelph, Ontario. She advises federal, provincial, and municipal policymakers and industry leaders on building sustainable and resilient communities. Her key area of expertise is in managing complex, multi stakeholder policy and decision making environments to deliver results, and she does. Karen has had a long interest in building more sustainable and resilient communities. She has worked in the nonprofit, public, and private sectors for over 30 years to advance community engagement in local decision and has led numerous community innovations in smart growth, downtown revitalization, open government, neighborhood development, 
community well-being, resource and natural heritage protection, community energy, and municipal government. And the list goes on. Her experience includes 11 years as the mayor of Guelph. I've had the pleasure of working with Karen, and I'm so pleased to invite her to the podium today. Please welcome Karen Farbridge. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to open the summit. Um, it's been just a pleasure to work with Beatrice and Suzanne in preparation for today. In arriving here today, you're accepting a call to action to act on climate change, and the regional chair gave some really good reasons that we need to do that. My assignment this morning is to strengthen your resolve, deepen the case for action, and I, I hope to do that through three themes. We will revisit, uh, see the, this works. Oops. <laughs> there we go. Okay. We will revisit an old refrain, think global, act local. What we might have once considered to be a really catchy phrase, it's been around for quite a few years, it's now an imperative that we achieve this. We're gonna explore your legacy um, in energy transitions, not only past ones, but the current one as well. And I would like us to consider energy security as an important consideration for building resilient communities, climate resilient communities. But first, let's set the stage for action. As the regional chair noted, we don't have to look beyond Niagara region anymore for the impacts of climate change. Extreme weather events are damaging local infrastructure, flooding basements, and washing out roads and parks with increasing frequency. Extreme heat is a growing public health concern, and the regional chair noted the, the, the rise and spread of infectious, infectious diseases that are impacting your area as well. The risk to the region's economy, to transportation corridors, the tourism industry, the agricultural sector, they're all growing. Um, so direct experience is, is building a case for action. We'll learn more about Niagara Adapts and your region's collaborative efforts to build climate resilience later this morning. Over the last year, the international, intergovernmental rather, panel on climate change released several reports as part of their sixth assessment on the global impacts of climate change. International scientists are now much more confident in their findings. Unfortunately, they have an additional 30 years of rising carbon emissions and impacts to test and refine their models since their first report in 1990. The language in these reports, if you've um, read any of them, and, and I would recommend the one for policymakers, uh, since all of you are policymakers, or most of you are in this room, it is precise and unflinching. And so it does make for grim reading. And there are two key messages that come out of these recent reports. We're not prepared for what's coming, and adaptation alone will not be sufficient. So the science continues to build the case for action. Since 1990, Canada has had nine climate change plans, yet we failed to hit any of our international commitments, from Rio to Kyoto to Copenhagen. Canada's immediate target, which goes beyond our Paris Agreement commitment, is to reduce emissions 40 to 45 percent below 2005 levels by 2030. That's seven and a half years away. As a net exporter of oil and gas, we've struggled as a nation to find our place in the transition to a decarbonized global energy system and economy. Ongoing challenges to climate and energy policies and programs at all levels of government in Canada send conflicting messages to consumers, the market, investors. We would be right to question our ability to step up to the in our international commitments and daunted by the magnitude of the task. 
there is a big gap between our aspirations and understanding the annual rate of actions and investments needed to get us to those, to those targets. In the early days of the pan pandemic, we amused ourselves with virtual backgrounds and filters. How many of you did that? Have you checked out the gallery view? I think it's gallery view on Teams. If you haven't, if you're on Teams, check it out because I, I defy you not to burst out laughing once you see the gallery view. So we were learning the ropes in a new virtual environment. So did you see this one? Do you remember this one? <laughs> um, it went viral because a lawyer sh appeared at a, a virtual judicial hearing as a, a, as a kitten because probably his children had been playing around with his filters and he had no idea how to turn them off. So he spoke to the judge as a kitten through, I think, the whole thing. <laughs> So I was thinking about, okay, what would be a good filter for me to sort of set the tone of my introductory remarks and even the regional chair's remarks because he gave us some pretty serious reasons to be, to be here and to be thinking about what we need to do. Um, so I found this one. There it is. <laughs> you know, like, oh my goodness. Um, and, and this is actually a filter. It's not just the painting. It's a filter that you can use. So my job this morning, despite this backdrop and the seriousness of the, of the, the statistics and the facts and the impacts, um, is, to, is to support you on your journey from the place of awareness and, and sense of urgency that has brought you all here today to fully embrace a call to action. So I'm going to share some insights and personal experiences, not to make light of the journey ahead, but I really want to make a key point, and this would be one of the most important ones, I think, to leave this morning with. And that is that wicked problems like climate change are often best addressed when local leaders, just like yourself, make a commitment to work together to build a more resilient, healthy, and prosperous community. And that's why so many of you are here today. So one of my earliest ventures into civic affairs left an indelible mark on me. Inspired by the 1992 United Nations Earth Summit, I joined several friends and colleagues to encourage my municipal government to act on climate change. There were no climate change emergency declarations 30 years ago, just building uh, investment in, in climate denial. Having only just left myself the quiet solitude of a research lab, I was far beyond my comfort zone when the mayor invited me to the podium. My biggest trepidation was exceeding the five minute time limit and getting the buzzer. <laughs> so I practiced forever and I never forgot that fear when I sat in the mayor's chair. I asked council to develop a community energy plan so that we could identify opportunities to reduce energy consumption and emissions while keeping energy dollars circulating in the local economy. More to the point, in that moment, all that was important was that I was so relieved to have finished my remarks with a few seconds to spare, no buzzer, and since no one had been asked any questions before me, I just simply returned back to my seat. But the mayor called me back, and a member of council actually wanted to ask me a question, and he did. I remember him rising slowly from his seat. He was a large man. He picked up his microphone and turned towards me. Who do you think you are? Why are you here and why have you wasted our time? So I didn't need a filter 30 years ago. That was my face on, on uh, cable TV cast out to the whole community. A few weeks later, the city engineer wrote it to the mayor recommending against the city setting emission targets noting that the municipality would not be able to undertake any fundamental initiatives to bring about change. Respectfully, I disagreed, and it launched a bit of a, a, a political career for me. And fortunately, thousands of communities around the globe also disagreed. The importance of local governments in the battle against climate change was clear even 30 years ago. The role of local governments was recognized in the 1997 Kyoto Protocol. Local governments also gathered in Paris and signed the Paris City Hall Declaration. 
In the last few years, more than 2,000 local governments have declared climate emergencies, including Niagara Region. So you're in good company being here today. Unlike the city engineer in my story 30 years ago, we now understand that communities are for responsible for over half of Canada's energy and greenhouse energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. I may have been a decade too early asking my city council to develop a community energy plan. Guelph would not approve its first plan until 2007. But for the last two decades, hundreds of Canadian municipalities have been advancing climate mitigation and adaptation. From this extensive body of re research, we now know the local pathways to net zero and to enhance the resilience of our local energy systems. The policies in your regional official plan are an ex excellent example of this growing understanding of what we need to do to address climate mitigation and adaptation. You, you are going to have the opportunity to explore these pathways this afternoon and what needs to be done to advance them. There is a local movement underway in Canada that is building a body of knowledge for delivering pragmatic, <clears throat> excuse me, pragmatic on the ground solutions to move us to net zero. And I believe we're at the precipice of scaled implementation at the local level. You will hear from some of these leaders in this space um, er, this morning after my remarks. I also believe that Canadian municipalities, despite their inadequate constitutional status, a little plug there, we do, do have an advantage over federal, federal and provincial counterparts. Municipal governments can skip past the ideological arguments over energy subsidies and carbon taxes, battles that have bogged down federal and provincial progress, and they can focus instead on decisions that clearly benefit their communities while simultaneously reducing energy emissions. They can also bring some balance back to the climate debate in Canada. National climate conversations are obsessed with energy supply. On the one hand, the growth and, and expansion of renewable energy um, for domestic use, and on the other hand, oil sands, natural gas, and export pipelines. Canadian municipal governments hold the other half of the energy equation, and that is where and how we use energy, regardless of where it comes from. There is so much common ground to be found on the demand side of the ledger that it would be a travesty for any community to walk away from it. And it would also be an economic mistake. The markets that support the pathways to net zero have grown substantially over the last two decades. Our second panel this morning will highlight some of the growing market, market opportunities that are, that are available. So this is your wheelhouse. Canadian municipal governments and their community partners are on the front line of mitigation and adaptation. So taking control of the narrative, reducing risk, seizing opportunities, are all another, are all another good case for action. Canadian governments are wonderfully diverse. Risks and opportunities in the energy transition vary across the country. However, there's one thing that we share in common, our modern energy system. Our modern energy system is comprised of three main parts, very familiar to you, electricity, natural gas, and transportation fuels. These three systems are highly centralized, very complex, highly regulated, and operate largely in silos. Our modern energy system has improved our quality of life, increased material possessions, offered more leisure and educational opportunities, and significantly enhanced personal mobility. However, we are becoming more conscious that this remarkable energy system comes at a high cost. Like the Greek cultural hero Prometheus, we are discovering there are some unintended consequences. Prometheus ran into trouble when he stole fire from the gods for humanity. For his crime, he was chained to a rock and an eagle sent to eat his liver, so the story goes. His liver grew back every night, open only to be eaten the next day. His story is a metaphor for unintended consequences 
And we're learning that our modern energy system has come with unintended, unintended consequences of Promethean proportions. The planet, rather than Prometheus, is suffering from our reliance on fossil fuels. Fuel consumption in Canada accounts for almost three quarters of our energy use, so it's not something small that we're talking about here. Energy costs are going up, with or without the actions of Putin, and on average, more than 85% of energy spending leaves local economies. And about half of the energy that we pay for in Canada is wasted. These are often shocking statements to hear for the first time, so let me provide an example. Waterloo Region found that their community spent $2.1 billion on energy in 2014. This has only gone up since then and 1.8 billion of those dollars left the community. They also tracked how energy flowed through their community and how much was made available or useful to consumers and how much was wasted along the way. They found that 45% of the energy that they purchased was wasted. So looking at it another way, they describe it as they spent nearly a billion dollars a year importing environmental waste. Since we all share the same energy system, my colleagues and I see similar results in other communities, and yours would be in the similar ballpark. I think that is a really compelling case for action. Are you familiar with this event? Has anybody um, turned your lights off at a certain time of the day once a year um, and lit a candle in solidarity for a more sustainable future? Between you and me, I've never liked this event, um, and I apologize if any of you have been an organizer or anybody online has been an organizer. It might be because when I was mayor, the media would drive by and report on my global solidarity. Um, hopefully I was actually home and not my teenage son at that particular time. And while I do appreciate global solidarity and expressions of that, I could never shake that this wasn't the message that was really being sent to people. Shivering in the cold, huddled around an open flame. Humans have advanced through several energy eras. This was our first one. It lasted several million years, until the domestication of animals about 10,000 years ago. A few thousand years later, humans figured out how, how to harness wind and moving water. Control of greater energy flows over human history has contributed to population growth and the emergence of cities, different cultures and civilizations, and today a global economy. Early European settlers arriving in Niagara region relied on a pre-industrial energy system. The chemical energy stored in their food allowed them to survive in the backwoods, build their homes, and farm the land. They burned wood to stay warm and cook their food, and they harnessed the muscle power of draft animals to ease their burden. By the mid-1800s, water mills were found across Upper Canada, grinding grain into flour and soaring logs into lumber. Mills played an influential role in establishing early European settlement patterns in Canada. They were the economic and social hub for largely rural populations, and millers played an important role in the life of early settlers. Remnants of these early mills are found in many communities today, like your own, and they reflect the entrepreneurism of local leaders eager for their communities to prosper. The invention of the steam, en steam engine in the 18th century led to the transition to a new energy era that revolutionized industry, agriculture, and transportation. Machines began doing the work of humans and animals, and biomass fuels, wood, and charcoal began to re be replaced by fossil fuels, initially coal. Another energy transition in the 19th century would deliver our modern energy system, centered on electricity and oil and gas. The story of electricity in Canada has deep roots in Ontario and this region. Like the early millers, it is always also a story about local entrepreneurs. By the end of the 19th century, American coal and local steam powered most of Ontario's industrial activity. However, as the century turned 
energy security became a growing concern for local politicians and boards of trade. Rising coal prices and frequent shortages began to threaten local prosperity. Does that sound familiar with today's um, times? Interest grew in an emerging new energy technology, electricity. Soon after the turn of the century, most electrical systems in Ontario were owned by municipal governments, eager for their communities to benefit from this new energy technology. 14 Ontario cities formed the Power for the People movement and were instrumental in the formation of the Hydroelectric Power Commission of Ontario. And Sir Adam Beck, the commission's first chairman, was an early champion as the mayor of London, Ontario. Abundant, cheap, renewable Niagara hydroelectric power arrived in Ontario homes for the first time in 1910. And thus began a long and successful era of a publicly owned and centralized electricity system that integrated energy generation and transmission. The transition from steam power to centralized electricity brought new energy security to Ontario communities and they thrived. And this is the legacy of your region in Canada and Ontario. As demand for electricity grew in Ontario, we turned to other primary energy sources to meet, to generate power and meet needs, fossil fuels and nuclear power. However, they introduced new inefficiencies and waste into the system. While climate change is a key driver, absolutely, uh, no question, um, of, of the, this modern energy transition. There are also other factors driving the transition to a net zero future. More cost competitive distributed and renewable energy technologies are disrupting centralized energy systems. You have acknowledged these new technologies in your new official plan. The costs of renewable energy like wind and solar along with battery power and storage are declining rapidly as investments in clean energy technology increases. New energy technologies are also helping to address growing security, energy con security concerns, including cost and accessibility and reliability. Your new regional economic development strategy has already signaled a call to action, recognizing an opportunity to build upon a long tradition of ent energy entrepreneurism that now spans four energy eras in this region. The net zero energy transition is underway. The big question is, will it happen fast enough to make a difference on climate change? So how might your region contribute to accelerating this transition? Energy security has been a key driver of energy transitions and the innovation and ingenuity of humans since the domestication of animals. For millennia, people have understood the importance of energy security for resilient, healthy, and prosper prosperous communities. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has disrupted global oil and gas supplies, impacting economies around the world, and once again, elevating energy security concerns. European, Europe is scrambling to replace Russia, Russian oil and gas to reduce the risk to their economies and to stop financing Putin's war. Unlike the 1970s oil embargo, which saw oil prices increase 300% in a few months, nations must now balance climate commitments while addressing their energy concerns. While European countries have no choice but to find some short-term replacements for Russian oil and gas, they are also accelerating investments in the energy transition. History has shown that many of the significant energy reforms of the past 50 years have come out of conflict and high prices. In the United States, the 1970s oil crisis led to the nation's first ever fuel efficiency standards for cars and trucks and led to new research in alternatives to oil and gas. European and Scandinavian economies went further, fundamentally reshaping their economies to make them significantly less vulnerable to oil shocks. While they've learned the hard way that they have more to do, we can track the roots of the net zero energy transition back to the 1970s oil crisis. 
Does anybody recognize this place? Has anybody traveled to Iceland? If you have, you probably stopped here or wish you had stopped here. This is the Blue Lagoon, an outdoor geothermal spa that's conveniently located between the airport and Reykjavik. In addition to being a hot tourist attraction, the hot water is piped to thousands of homes in the region. And you can see the thermal plant in the background. <clears throat> Almost 100% of the electricity consumed in this small country comes from renewable energy. Almost all their homes are heated directly from geothermal energy delivered through district energy systems. Their economy, which includes welcoming two million tourists a year and to meeting the energy needs of some high intensive energy use industries that are attracted to the country, is almost exclusively powered by renewable energy from hydroelectric and geothermal sources. The only exception is their reliance on fossil fuels for transportation, but even this is rapidly changing with electric vehicles already making up half of new vehicle registrations. Just to put that into perspective, Ontario sits around 2%, not half. Yet this was not always the case. Until the 1970s, the largest share of Iceland's energy consumption was derived from imported fossil fuels. The drive to transition away from a reliance on imported oil and gas was not climate change, not in the 1970s, but a desire to protect their economy from fluctuating global oil prices. Farmers led the country's journey to energy security and lower energy costs. As an important part of the local economy, yes, but they also had serious concerns about food security for their people. A country or a region's energy mix and consumption patterns vary significantly, and local conditions are going to determine opportunities for renewable energy sources. So we can't look forward to a geothermal spa in Niagara on the lake anytime soon. Um, nevertheless, Iceland's experience does provide several lessons for any jurisdiction. One was the co cohesion and collaboration that was achieved between municipal government, entrepreneurs, and the public. They built trust and a solutions-based mindset early in their journey to greater energy self-sufficiency. Today, this has built the foundation for Iceland's transition to net zero. Municipalities engaged and learned from local entrepreneurs they created a favorable environment, policy environment, to support local generation and distribution of renewable energy. And they showcased every step of their success. Remember these images um, during the pandemic, during the COVID lockdown, um, of the increase in air quality in certain places that occurred? Reykjavik was able to show similar photos decades ago um, to sh demonstrate the improved air quality in their capital city, resulting from investments in geothermal resources instead of fossil fuels. In my work, I see communities struggle to build, or perhaps more to the point, sustain the broad community collaboration necessary to implement the, pl implement the plans that they have approved. So what impresses me about the approach you're taking in Niagara region is that you're setting your intentions to collaborate first and then getting, planning to get to work. So coming to a conclusion, uh, local action, your legacy, and the opportunity to build local resilience all make, I believe, a really strong case for action. So what is it gonna take? When I first saw uh, the news of Russia's invasion of Ukraine several months ago, I just assumed it was over for the country. Perhaps I'd accepted the myth, myth of, of Russia, Russia's military might. I certainly did not predict the remarkable courage and determination of the Ukrainian people. Their resistance has inspired support from around the world. And while the war continues to rage and more needs to be done, I have been moved by the expressions of solidarity from individuals and organizations around the world. See, I, I told you I did believe in acts of global solidarity, just perhaps not with Earth Hour. Um, from, from lighting up Niagara Falls and the Eiffel Tower, 
to the brave journalist who protested the war during a live broadcast on Russian state TV, to the Museum of Medical History in Latvia that hung this brutal two-story poster on, of Putin on the building, which happened to be just across the road from the Russian embassy, to the cancellation of chess tournaments and the World Taekwondo Association stripping Putin of his honorary black belt. I think that one must have hit clo close to home. I have often read that we need a wartime approach to fighting climate change, and I'm better understanding the analogy today. Like the people of Ukraine, we need to be prepared to do what it takes to win. Our leaders need to rally the public at every opportunity. We need to identify the institutions and resources need needed to get the job done. We must leave no one behind, and everyone must do their bit. My biggest concern is that we will leave people behind without local action, without local leaders looking out for the interests of their communities and the people that live there. We have seen how when countries compete, it can get messy. Trade wars, economic sanctions, armed conflict. Often neither side emerges a clear winner. However, when cities or city regions compete with one another for investment or for talent, it looks very different. So what do we do? Well, we invest in our quality of life. We invest in the infrastructure that delivers that. So how great is that? In doing so, we raise the bar for everyone and we share our success. Elected officials like to brag about their communities anytime they get. And we all win when they do, because we all learn from each other. So we absolutely need to learn from communities around the glo globe. There is excellent work being done in all kinds of communities. But we also can look locally and regionally for, some, for our inspiration as well. And so I'm going to leave you with three examples of, of three local um, activities. Several Ontario municipalities have launched energy retrofit programs to help residents reduce energy costs. They're all going to learn from each other and continue to improve these programs. And you're going to hear from one of them this morning, Durham Region, and their new efforts in this, in this part of the energy transition. So why is this important? Without early action on efficiency, the energy transition to net zero emissions will be more expensive and much more difficult to achieve. Energy efficiency is the first fuel of today's energy transition. These programs will also buffer residents and businesses from rising energy costs. Brampton has recently approved a net zero secondary plan to advance its official plan climate policies. No retail natural gas is planned for the Heritage Heights greenfield development. Uh, the energy transition is it's on its way. Your new official plan includes a powerful statement. Land use planning is an important driver for mitigating and adapting to climate change. Why is this important? One, it's not well accepted across this province at least. And new developments must quickly seek to achieve net zero emissions. There is neither sufficient time or resources to, for resources in 30 years for today's developments to be retrofitted. We need to get them right today for a future of 2050. And last, the Waterloo Region Community Energy is an innovative collaboration between municipal government and local utilities to deliver energy, community energy solutions that will reduce the wasted energy that they discovered, reduce energy costs, and lower emissions. This is important because we need examples of new governance innovations for sustained implementation. There were no electrical ut utilities at the end of the 19th century. They had to be built, and then they had to be scaled to have impact across the province. A new energy system is being built in these communities and many others, one that is cleaner, more efficient, and more resilient. And that is probably, I think, the best case that I can think of for action. Given our national performance and the magnitude of the task, it might seem unreasonable to believe that we can leave the age of fossil fuels behind and do what the planet requires of us. 
But it would also be unwise to say it's impossible. Only our actions will make it possible. You know why you need to act. That is why we're all here, and I hope I've helped to build the case. We know how to build a climate-friendly community. The pathways have been identified, and you will explore them this afternoon to begin the journey. It is the actions of communities around the globe that actually give me the most hope. There are ways to act. Carbon emissions can be tracked. Goals can be set to provide a sense of focus, progress, and direction. It will take cooperation and collaboration with all branches of community, including government and business leaders. This is a wonderful expression of that. So this is your call to action, your moment to advance your legacy and build a cleaner, more efficient, and resilient energy system for Niagara region. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Thank you very much, Karen. We have a little gift for you. It's some of our local jam from local fruit from Niagara region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very wise words and meaningful examples on climate action taking place in communities and the importance of community partnerships, moving beyond government policy, but looking to our partners in the community to accelerate climate action. You are always inspiring, and I very much appreciate the history lesson and thankful for the photos of examples in Niagara region. It's interesting that you brought the scream on, on, the, screen to, on the screen today. The scream by Edward Munch, funny enough, has been actually one of my fascinations since I was young. And when I was 12, I asked my parents to go see it when it came to Toronto. The scream is actually unique and has followed me through my journey because the painting was painted after Krakatoa exploded and changed the landscape of the sky, which is why it's orange. So it's unique that you brought that up. We actually did not plan this. <laughs> it's unique that you brought that. Um, because it's that example of how when, we, when the natural systems affect our environment, it affects our well-being and it affects our community. So thank you for putting that on your presentation today. Now it's time for a break. We will take about a 10 to 15 minute break and I will call you back. Bathrooms are upstairs or out the hallway to the left. There are tea, coffee, and refreshments for yourselves, so please enjoy. Thank you.
Hello everybody, I hope you're enjoying your break, but I would like to ask that you please start making your way back to your tables, grab your last cup of coffee, snack, and then we'll get started. Hello everyone. I think we are all too excited to be in person. It's hard. I do feel guilty cutting off the in-person conversation right now. I, I have to admit, it's so nice to hear the buzz in the room. But I wanted to introduce our very exciting next speakers from the Regional Chairs Youth Advisory Panel. The Regional Chairs Youth Advisory Panel was created in November 2021 to provide the Chair and Regional Council with a fresh perspective on matters that affect young people across the region. With a membership that represents each of Niagara's 12 municipalities, the panel got to work immediately, as all young people do, providing their input on the issues, that matter most to youth in Niagara. Recently, the panel provided formal feedback on Niagara's official plan, emphasizing the importance of Niagara's natural heritage and climate. After learning about this summit, panel members were eager to have the opportunity to participate in today's event. 
to share the perspective of the region's youth on the importance of tackling climate change, and I believe they deserve that honor. Please welcome the Regional Chair's Youth Advisory Panel Chair, Saloni Sharma. She's a resident of Niagara Falls. And Vice Chair Keegan Hudley, who's a resident of Grimsby. If you can both come up, that would be great. My name is Saloni Sharma, and I am currently serving as the chair of the Regional Chairs Youth Advisory Panel. And I'm Keegan Headley, the vice chair of the panel. We would like to thank the Regional Council for being the catalyst of this climate change summit, and Chair Bradley for inviting us to speak today. <coughs> we are here representing the Regional Chairs Youth Advisory Panel. The panel is made up of 12 teens with different backgrounds, experiences, and perspectives representing each of the 12 municipalities in Niagara. As a panel, we aim to provide a fresh perspective on matters that affect youth and our communities. We provide advice on items such as the environment, public transportation, housing and homelessness, mental health, and other issues that affect young people. The panel is unified by each member's collective passion to help build Niagara's future. And that brings us to why we're here today. This morning, you have heard and will be hearing from many climate experts, and while we know the crucial part of seeing the stark data in black and white plays in our understanding of the impacts of climate change, we are not here to repeat facts and figures. Everyone in this room today already knows the facts and understands what needs to happen. What we are here to do is make sure that the diverse voices across Niagara youth are heard as a part of this conversation to share with you and our leaders of Niagara the sincere passion and concern for the climate and the climate crisis that the youth have. We are here for the perspective of future citizens who will be living with and paying for the results of the action or inaction of the leaders of today. Growing up in the Niagara region, we appreciate the natural beauty and unique ecosystems that contribute to our green and abundant surroundings. When it comes to climate change, what we worry about and what we care about is keeping this green and biodiverse Niagara for years to come. We want a sustainable Niagara for us to live and work in that continues to have clean air, water, food, and safety. We want to know that Niagara will continue to be a community in which we can enjoy living in, and especially one that will provide the same health and opportunities in the future that we benefit from today. I want this for us, for my generation, and for future generations to come. What we know is that if the climate change crisis continues to be ignored or pushed further down the road of inaction, that the future we care about today will not be a reality tomorrow. As youth, we feel strongly about what is at stake for our future if action is not taken on climate change. So, we were encouraged to be here today, where today's leaders will have the opportunity to be the change makers on climate for Niagara. Niagara Regional Council has declared a climate emergency, and there can be no mistake on what that must mean. When there is an emergency, immediate action is required. In addition, the right services, tools, and equipment to deal with the emergency are required as well. This declaration is a crucial step for climate change action. It is a recognition that we are seeing more instances in, of, and increasing severity of climate change impacts, including days of extreme heat, severe weather events, drought, flooding, increase in poor air quality days, and a recognition that this is harmful, is impacting our communities, and needs urgent and meaningful action. We can already see and appreciate actions being taken to reduce climate change impacts. These measures show the positive things happening in our communities and are ones that, as residents of the Niagara region, we can be proud of. For example, Council's declaration of a climate emergency, this climate action summit itself, our move to one harmonized transit system, the update of Niagara's official plan, which identifies climate actions, our bi-weekly garbage pickup, which is increasing organic collection and decreasing landfill and 
landfill gas, along with abundant sources of clean energy, including hydroelectricity. The work done so far is commendable, and it's important to moving the needle on climate change. But it is not enough, and we need to do more if we truly want to respond to a climate emergency. So the question is, where do we go from here? And what do we as youth hope for our future? And ask the leaders of Niagara to make that future a reality. To answer that question, let us share a quote with you that was chosen by one of our panel members, who saw this as the heart of what we wish for today. Blessed is he who plants trees under whose shade he will never sit. This is an Indian proverb that encapsulates the philosophy that we need our leaders to adopt when making decisions and policies now and in the future. The difficult decisions that must be made are ones of which we may not benefit from directly, but will follow you as your legacy into the future. We, the youth, will be forever grateful for the tree this room plants today for every difficult decision you make that won't benefit you today, but will improve the communities of tomorrow. So what does planting this tree now for the shade of those tomorrow look like in real terms as far as climate action and the commitments you make here today? Currently, the earth is about 1.1 degrees centigrade warmer than it was in the late 1800s, and humans continue to produce more and more greenhouse gases annually. To keep global warming no more than 1.5 degrees centigrade, as called for in the Paris Agreement, emissions need to be reduced by 45% by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050. The United Nations says that moving to net zero, that moving to net zero world is one of the greatest challenges we have ever faced. It will require a complete change in how we build things, what we purchase, and how we move around our communities. We think it is important for you to know that there is a growing coalition of countries, cities, businesses, and institutions pledging themselves to get to net zero emissions. More than 70 countries, over 1,200 companies, more than 1,000 cities, and over 1,000 educational institutions and over 400 financial institutions have joined the UN's Race to Zero, pledging to take the needed action to cut their emissions in half by 2030. We appreciate that we may not have all the pieces in place and all the data we require to make this commitment today, but this room represents some of the most powerful leaders in our community. And we respectfully encourage you on behalf of Niagara's youth to take the necessary steps to join with the thousands of other businesses, cities, and schools and countries across the globe and commit Niagara to doing our part to impact climate change. The choices you make today in this room and going forward will have an impact on our futures and the futures of next generations. As we prepare to wrap up our presentation to you today, as the voice of youth in Niagara, we ask you to do what is right to make our sustainable future a reality. That you make a true commitment to make a difference that you take actions today to benefit from tomorrow, and last but not least, that you keep the voices of Niagara's youth at the table. Just before we wrap up, uh, this is a video from the RCYAP panel members. Climate change is important to me because it defines our future defines the world that I'll live in and the world that my kids will live in. It's a truly universal issue. There is nobody who it doesn't affect. Everyone in some sense will experience the effects of this large global issue. The thing that scares me most about climate change is how rapidly it is happening right under our noses. Scientists are saying that if climate change isn't reversible, it's 50 to 250 years that we're gonna have left. 50 years, I will be 64 in 50 years. It is a global issue. No matter where I go, you cannot outrun the effects of rising average global temperature. Each decade since the 1980s is getting hotter and hotter. And it's, though it's only by a degree and a half, it's already, we can already feel the effects that climate change has on us. Sea levels are rising, animals are losing their homes, and there's increased risk of cancer. 
um, and it's not a political issue and we should all be on the same side about it because we all want the same thing. What scares me the most is that it's my future and the future of possibly my children and grandchildren. Despite all the education and despite all the learning we've done about it, we still haven't made a dent. I take it from a student myself, procrastinating never works out. If we go too far with polluting our region, there won't be a way to turn back. Climate change is not something that you can put on the back burner. It will not wait. We can't wait anymore. There is no plan B. How much time do we have left before we have to make a big change? Or is it too late already? We need to do it now and we need to change. I think that we need to do more now before it's too late. This is important. We need to take action. We can't delay. If we keep pushing it back and saying, oh, we'll do it, we'll be able to fix it. We're not able to fix it anymore. That's what we've been doing for the last 100 years. We need to work on it now or it's not going to be changeable. Dealing with climate change. Climate change. Climate change. Dealing with climate change is important. Niagara's leaders need to know. You need to know. You need to know. Need to know. This can't wait. This can't wait. Can't wait. The time is now. 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 The time is now. The time is now. Now is the time for us to take action. To take action. For us to take action. Our voices need to be heard. Before it's too late. Before it's too late. Before it's too late. Too late. Too late. So on behalf of the Regional Chairs Youth Advisory Panel, we thank you for having us here to speak today. It is our hope that you have not only listened, but have also understood. Thank you. We also have some jam for you both as well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Saloni and Keegan. Your passion is inspiring and exciting. I, when I was younger, I never liked when somebody told me I was the future because it made me not feel included today. And you are the future, but we need you today. And we need your voice, your partnership, and your passion to move the community forward on climate change action. So thank you very much. We're now gonna move into our panels for the rest of the morning. We have two panels today, and we also have a moderator, Amanda Smith, and I'd like to introduce her. Amanda holds a Master of Education from Brock University and is the Center Administrator at the Environmental Sustainability Research Center at Brock, where much of her work focuses on project management of the multiple innovative community partnership the center has formed over the past four years. Amanda was recently awarded with the Faculty of Social Sciences Staff Student Experience Award and was the 2019 recipient of FOSS's Staff Award for Community Engagement. So please welcome Amanda to the podium as she will be moderating our panels. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, so today we are fortunate to be joined by professionals who have led environmental and climate change action in their own communities. Since each panelist has a unique background, um, we'll be learning a bit more about specific projects and or partnerships from each of them through a short presentation. And then we'll be posing a few questions for, to all of them um, to gain a better sense of how we might move forward on important climate related issues we're facing right here in Niagara. So without further ado, I'd like to call up our, our three in-person panelists for our first panel. Um, so come on up. And we're having um, one panelist join us remotely as well. Hi, Ian. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> 
So I've done a lot of um, panels and, and facilitated a lot of panels before, never a hybrid model. So this is all new to me, and I'm going to be in charge of doing um, what Karen was most worried about, which is keeping panelists on time. Um, so without further ado, uh, we're going to start off by having a presentation by Dr. Jessica Blythe, who is the assistant uh, is an assistant professor at the Environmental Sustainability Research Center here at Brock University. She's one of my colleagues. Jessica's research focuses on how communities experience environmental change and what explains um, their differential capacities for adaptation and transformation. She is particularly interested in building the resilience of local communities to climate change. Her empirical work has been based in Eastern Africa, Melanesia, Australia, and most recently here in Southern Ontario. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Amanda, for the wonderful introduction. It's lovely to see everyone in person. Um, and I am very honored this morning to share a climate good news story of which we need more. Um, so fortunately, I get to introduce quickly the Niagara Adapt Partnership, which was a two-year partnership between seven municipalities here in Niagara uh, and Brock University. And I am thrilled to see, can you guys please wave? We've got Shannon Fernandez and Olivia Groff, who are the climate coordinators for two of our partners. Um, and this incredible partnership began BC, which is before COVID, if you can think back that long. Um, and we were working with the town of Lincoln at the time, and I'm thrilled to see Mayor Sandra Easton here as well, who has been a big advocate and supporter of this work. Uh, so we were working with Lincoln, and we found out they had just received um, Federation of the C Canadian Municipality funding for a climate coordinator position to work on a climate adaptation plan. And we realized through talking to some of our partners and colleagues that other municipalities in the region were on the exact same track at the same time. So we sent out a call to all 12 municipalities and said we'd like to work together and pool some of our resources to do this climate adaptation planning process as a, a big partnership rather than individually. And so over the course of two years, um, we went through all the stages of climate adaptation planning, um, we worked with climate projection data. We spoke with over a thousand people in the region because climate needs to be grounded in issues of justice and equity. We need to know how the lived experience is being experienced here in Niagara. Uh, we spoke at public events. We were honored to join the Celebration of Nations. We screened documentaries and hosted public panels. Um, what else? Oh, our graduate students were able to interact with the climate coordinators and our partners came and spoke in our classrooms. So there was all this really exciting work um, that happened. But ultimately, the most important thing is at the end of the two years, our municipal partners had developed and had climate endorsed evidence based climate adaptation plans, which I think is a huge accomplishment um, for the region and for each of the municipalities. So I am going to give you a, a bad news sandwich. You know, good news, bad news, good news. Um, there is some bad news, obviously. Uh, and one of the things I wanted to highlight is when we spoke to over 1,000, almost 1,100 Niagara residents, more than half, or 55% of people we spoke with, had personally experienced flooding. And we heard stories like, the first time my house flooded, it was covered by insurance. But the second time, it wasn't. And we know from places like the Intech Center that climate-induced uh, flooding costs, costs around $40,000, and that is more than households can bear. So some of the bad news is that we are experiencing climate right here today in Niagara. But I will finish with good news, and I think the really good news is when we spoke to those 1,000 people across the region, 85% of them supported my municipal funds being spent on climate action. And I think that's huge for us, you know? We sometimes might be reluctant or we don't know where people stand. And that's a very inspirational um, figure for us to keep in mind, is that Niagara Region residents want this and they support it uh, and they're, they're in our corner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Our next presenter is actually Ian McVeigh, who's joining us remotely. Um, Ian McVeigh is the Manager of Sustainability with Durham Region, where he is coordinating the implementation of, the Durham's, of Durham's climate change plans. Ian is responsible for championing action, uh, climate action across the region, working with internal municipal departments, local area municipalities, conservation authorities, energy utilities, and other key stakeholders to enable implementation. 
Ian holds a master's in environmental studies from York University and a bachelor of Co commerce from Concordia University. Welcome, Ian. Great, thank you very much. And can you hear me and see my slides? We can hear you and I think they're just switching and now we can see your slides. Great. Go ahead. Magic. So I'm gonna start my five minute timer and try to stick to it. So I'm uh, yeah, manager of sustainability with Durham Region. I sit within the office of the regional chair and chief administrative officer. Um, so really pleased to be here to tell you the story of Durham Greener Homes, a program to reduce emissions in our existing uh, housing stock. Um, so just first a brief introduction to Durham Region for those that don't know, we're I guess on the other side of the Greater Golden Horseshoe, uh, eight local area municipalities, varied context from urban to rural, uh, traditional treaty territory of the Mississaugas of Scubug Island, as well as the uh, Chippewas of uh, Georgina Island up there on, on Lake Sipco up, up hereabouts. Um, so, you know, similar context potentially to Niagara in terms of being two tier as well as having a, a, a wide range of sort of municipal context from small rural to uh, more, uh, more urbanized and industrial municipality, municipalities. I wanted to start with, um, you know, with this, this, you know, making the point that community climate action does matter. We often think about climate change as a, as a global issue amongst nation states with policy solutions like you know, carbon tax and cap and trade. But the reality is when you look at it on the ground is that local governments have either direct control or indirect control over more than half of Ontario's greenhouse gas emissions through a range of services and policy planning uh, 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 issues that are within their uh, jurisdiction. So it's really important what happens at the, at the regional and uh, local level. And so when we modeled our low carbon pathway, we developed a, a community energy plan in collaboration with the eight local, local area municipalities, the four energy utilities, with a model pathway towards our, our low carbon targets by, by 2050. It was clear that uh, in Durham's context, the most cost, cost effective emission reductions are in the transportation sector, and that's mainly personal transportation, i.e. commuting uh, to and from work and, and to uh, you know, uh, services and chores and, and whatnot, as well as the residential sector, i.e. You know, in Durham's context, and, you know, probably similar in Niagara, like sing, single family homes, which make up the, the lion's share of our uh, housing stock. So in Durham region, we have 20,000 uh, single family homes. So that's sort of the target of our, of our Durham Greener Homes program. Um, just want to highlight again sort of our influence. So we have, you know, obviously a high degree of influence over, over our own infrastructure that we own, our own buildings, fleet, solid waste, which the region pr pr provides, uh, and lesser influence over, over uh, emissions within the, within the c community. So that's really the realm of the, the Durham Community Energy Plan, which really relies on collaboration across the, the upper lower tier, uh, municipalities, energy utilities, as well as a, all, a whole range of other actors. So I'll talk briefly about what, what that looks like in the context of the Durham Greener Homes program. But what, what I'll say here is that, you know, as a municipality, upper and lower tier, we're responsible for about 5% of emissions directly within our own sort of assets and infrastructure. Um, so clearly not, not, you know, we don't, we can't directly control the low carbon tr tr transition and we need that sort of that uh, collaborative implementation. So at Durham Greener Homes, we were successful in, in securing uh, uh, funding from the Federation of Canadian Municipalities through the Community Efficiency Financing Program for this uh, program concept, which really relies on this idea of a home energy coach, which is both like a high tech digital virtual service as well as a, a high touch in person, sorry, uh, not in person, but over the phone or, or web, web meeting type interaction with a, with a qualified building energy science expert who um, can help the homeowner through the process of getting an energy assessment done, uh, identifying qualified contractors, getting quotes for them, reviewing those quotes to, uh, you know, ensure that they're, they're comparable, that the homeowner's got uh, an apples to apples comparison of, of, of what the quotes entail. The home energy coach is going to help the homeowner evaluate incentive programs and determine which are best suited to their given project. And should they need financing, um, we partnered with a group of local cr credit unions who were able to provide uh, loan capital. So I'm going to talk a bit about what the collaboration looks like, both internally and externally. So there's been a, a lot of collaboration internally with our finance department and our legal on the financing program design. Ours is the first of its kind in Canada that relies on this loan loss reserve or credit enhancement to support the credit union lending. 
with our corporate services and IT teams on the development of a secure client portal for the Durham Greener Homes program so that we have an ability to, to, to uh, maintain an information database on that, on that uh, participating homeowner with our own housing portfolio to advance deep, re deep retrofit uh, de de demonstrations in our own portfolio so that we're walking the talk. Externally, with our energy utilities on data analysis and uh, market characterization, with our with our credit unions, as I mentioned, with our third-party program administrators, who we partner with a nonprofit to to sort of be the face of the program, and most importantly, with the skilled trades, the industry on on uh, training. So my time's running short, but I'll say that we launched this event uh, late April at the Durham College School of Skilled Trades, which which was fantastic, and since then I've had a lot of success and uptake on the web page with more than 10,000 web visits, uh, more than 100 active uh, participants in the program, which is a great start given that we're less than two months in and actually haven't done very much active marketing. Uh, we have now activated our post-launch marketing campaign just just uh, a couple of weeks ago with uh, paid, paid advertisement in Durham, Durham community newspapers and I've seen a big bump since then. So it's a great success story. I'm over time, I'm gonna stop, thank you. Thank you, Ian. You're, you did great with the time. I'm sorry you felt rushed. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll hear more about it through the questions. Um, so our next speaker, Paul Emile McNabb, is the Vice President of Business Development at the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business. Um, Paul Emile has been active in the field of research, consulting, fundraising, and business development for the past 15 years. In 2007, he completed his honours degree in History, Political Science, and Canadian Studies at the University of Toronto. In 2010, he completed his Master's in Environmental Studies at York University with a focus on Indigenous knowledge and a major research paper entitled the traditional ways of the sorry the traditional ways the traditional rights of ways on the Walpole Island First Nation he has served as a member of the research advisory committee with the Canadian Energy Research Institute the chair of the national advisory committee with origin incorporated and the current vice president of the board of directors for the aboriginal legal services he currently resides in toronto and is an avid follower of sports and business welcome paul meal Thank you, it's great uh, to be here today. It's great to get out and see everyone again. Um, so Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, um, we're a national organization. Um, we've been around for nearly 40 years. We'll be celebrating our anniversary uh, in 2024. Um, so who are we, what do we do? Um, essentially, we're a network um, that was created uh, to build more uh, relationships, uh, partnerships, uh, opportunities between uh, indigenous businesses uh, and uh, corporate Canada. But I, I think really we've we've come a long way. Um, you know, Brock University is is now a, a member of uh, CCAB. Uh, we work with really every industry, um, college, university now, not for profit association. So. Uh, essentially, um, you know, our membership is made of about 60% of our members are Indigenous businesses. So what does that mean? So looking at uh, in entrepreneurs, uh, you know, privately owned uh, Indigenous businesses, uh, community economic uh, development corporations owned by First Nation, Inuit and Métis communities, um, and they join our organization. You know, they're looking for more uh, business opportunities, networking, they're looking to uh, tap into the CCAB network and in turn uh, we work with uh, you know many non-indigenous businesses, as I mentioned, um, that are looking to to build more relationships. Uh, they're looking to start their journey in terms of uh, economic uh, business reconciliation, which I think was a very uh, important component of Section 92.5 and TRC. So that's kind of what, where we are right now. And and you know the most interesting thing about my role at CCAB is really every single week I'm engaging in every single industry. Uh, as a national organization, I'm pretty much the last two months I've been everywhere across the country at a different conference, uh, whether it's last week I was at Collision talking about Indigenous and tech, and obviously very pleased to be here today talking about uh, renewables, uh, green energy, which is so important uh, in terms of uh, Indigenous peoples and, and, you know, really my learnings and teachings. I mean, I learned from, from elders, um, the community at the Walpole Island First Nation on, uh, you know, traditional rights of ways. Uh, what does that mean in terms of the intersection of, of technology and um, it was a story of how they built the, the roads in the community and, and how Henry Ford brought the first car to a First Nation in Canada. So that's kind of uh, my background in history and, and obviously the work I do at CCAB is 
you know, really about cultivating those relationships and, and helping Indigenous entrepreneurs and businesses uh, get connected and, and help them with, you know, whether it's more tools and services or different programming. Um, and, and working with, with different organizations. And, and I mentioned, you know, Green Energy has, you know, well over 300 um, partnerships now between First Nation, Inuit, Métis communities, um, uh, Green Energy partnerships uh, on the corporate side. Uh, it's really, you know, such an important uh, sector. Um, I can speak no more than, obviously, uh, Six Nations of the Grand River Development Corporation who won our award for, for Green Energy in 2017. So, um, you know, looking at, you know, just even uh, renewables, remote communities, and, and looking at their transition off diesel. So there's a lot of really exciting initiatives going on. And really what we're seeing is, what I've seen, you know, I've been at CCAB since 2013. Um, we've really moved from the why to the how. And, and really um, looking at um, really genuine equity stakes in projects and in different industries, especially green energy, uh, and really moving forward um, with with like real genuine relationships and, and how to engage. And I think uh, part of our organization and, and my role is, is looking at that, uh, is looking at starting that journey and, and how to properly engage with uh, indigenous communities. And keeping in mind that, you know, each, you know, there's 634 uh, First Nations plus Inuit Métis communities. You know, each, each community um, has its own, you know, vision. Um, for what economic, you know, self-determination, what economic development means to them. And I think that's so important in understanding. Um, and understanding, at looking at each community in terms of their capacity as well and, and where they are in economic development. So I'll just uh, stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our final panelist for this first panel this morning is Alan Unwin. Dean of Business, Tourism and Environment Division at Niagara College. Alan worked as an environmental consultant for numerous years, both in the fields of waste management and ecological restoration before joining Niagara College in 1995 as a full-time faculty member. In September of 2011, Alan became the Associate Dean of Business, Tourism and Environment. Alan holds a Bachelor of Environmental Studies degree from the University of Waterloo and a Master of Education degree from the University of Toronto and serves on the editorial board for the Ecological Restoration Journal, published out of Rutgers University. Alan is a past chair of the Society of um, Ecological Restoration, an international non-governmental organization based out of Washington, D.C., the third Canadian to have ever held this post. In March of this past year, Alan joined members of the Canadian federal government on the ground in Geneva, Switzerland, in negotiating the next global agreement of the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversity. The global, the Global Biological um, Diversity Framework, GBF, is set to be signed at the next Conference of Parties in, in Kunming, China, scheduled for the fall of 2022. This agreement is intended to drive the reduction and elimination of biodiversity loss globally by 2050. Please welcome Alan. Quick, quick edit on the intro, and thank you for that. Um, the uh, GBF, the Global Biodiversity Framework, is set to be signed, it was set to be signed in Kunming, China, but they recently announced that it'll move to the headquarters in Montreal uh, in December. So very exciting to have something of that uh, magnitude uh, discussed, negotiated, and ultimately signed in Canada. So I wanted to make that quick edit, but you know that just happened last week, so you can't blame me. Um, on the bio side. So I had a, a quick uh, uh, presentation I wanted to run through within the five minute allotted time. Put that up on the screen. I think so, they're working on it. Yeah, there, there it is. So uh, yeah, advancing the slides, I suppose, will occur when I make some indication therein. But, or press the green button. Green button at the top. Anyway. Um, yeah, obviously we're coming out of a pandemic and, and it uh, is um, obviously a time to refocus and look at other challenges and, and certainly applaud the effort today to have this conversation on climate change. And, and uh, I do like this graphic because I think these are things that we know are lining up uh, as waves that we're going to have to deal with regardless uh, as we exit the pandemic. And certainly climate change is there, but uh, an even larger concern uh, on some fronts and many fronts is on the biodiversity collapse that we're experiencing. 
And, and so what I thought I wanted to do today was bring into the discussion a lot of focus so far on um, you know, mitigation strategies, uh, various ways communities can support uh, adaptate, uh, uh, mitigation, but I, I did want to spend a bit of time looking at uh, strategies that, that, that provide a focus for community members to involve themselves in the adaptation side of it. Um, and, and that's where nature comes in, and I, I find this particular graphic really compelling. Obviously, when you look at the global economic uh, situation, the World Economic Forum has the three top risks listed there that are all environmental. Um, certainly climate action failure, extreme weather, which you could, of course, uh, uh, connect back to the first one, and then biodiversity loss. More compelling to me, though, is the graphic on, on the, the far right of the screen, which is $44 trillion. Uh, the, the economic output uh, globally hinges uh, on nature uh, in that regard. So $44 trillion uh, comes from nature. Uh, and, and therefore, that is something to consider as we move forward on the adaptation uh, side of things. So, you know, risks arising from biodiversity loss are listed there. Many of them, I think, uh, connect back to climate change in obvious ways. Obviously, exacerbation of climate change, some of the impacts that we're seeing on coastal communities, uh, the, the impact of uh, nature-based solutions in addressing some of these issues is clear. Uh, and it's a concept that you may not be familiar with, but nature-based solutions, it's defined there uh, by the IUCN, which is one of the global uh, leaders when it comes to some of the work involved in uh, NGOs and focused on restoration and other related uh, sort of natural challenges. Uh, actions to protect, sustainably manage, and restore natural or modified ecosystems that address societal challenges effectively and adaptively simultaneously providing human well-being and biodiversity benefits. And, you know, what are those biodiversity benefits uh, from nature-based solutions? Well, that sort of top level, I think, really, to me, resonates in terms of the discussion today. So greenhouse gas reductions, upwards of 10 gigatons per year, uh, has been uh, identified as an opportunity to use nature-based solutions to remove that amount of carbon dioxide from our atmosphere flood and erosion control, so you get into sort of the adaptation on the impact side with better uh, resilient ecosystems on our coastal uh, systems. Coastal defense mentioned specifically cooling and shading, sort of urban forestry is becoming you know, quite uh, relevant in that discussion. And then some direct human benefits, food and water security, livelihoods, cultural values, uh, and social capital. So quickly, you know, where do we fit into this? Uh, I, I was putting this together quickly, and I thought back, if you recall, the 2005 movie, An Inconvenient Truth. It's the 2005 part is just shocking to me that it was that long ago. But there's a moment in that movie that always resonated me, with me quite a bit, is that people tend, when you talk about communities, to go from denial to despair without sort of pausing in the middle, which is where we have to act, right? Uh, and I think when we look at nature-based solutions, that's where I think uh, there is that pause, that part where community can involve themselves on that, you know, that space between denial and despair. You know, so you know, how do you do that? And that's where my background in restoration, I think, has been very focused on getting you know, students educated. Many, I see some of them today, and it's great to see them. Um, but other local organizations that our grads go and work for and with, conservation authorities. Uh, certainly we've got a renewed focus with our NPCA on restoration work. Uh, land care, uh, land cares themselves, local stewardship efforts that are out there right now, nature conservancies. And, and I, the point I, I think also that I want to drive home is that if we're gonna really realize nature-based solutions uh, and all that it offers, it has to move beyond just symbolic tree planting that we actually have to involve ourselves in genuine restoration efforts. Uh, that UN Global Biodiversity Framework that's being negotiated right now, that will hopefully be signed in December, uh, has a goal to, to uh, restore 20% of degraded ecosystems by 2030. Uh, target 8, in fact, looks at the mitigation, uh, climate change mitigation that will play out as a result of some of the targets that are, that are being negotiated right now. So that's sort of the morning's uh, you know, plenary talked about global. That's sort of the global uh, perspective. But 
in reality, all restoration effort is local, so it's going to require everybody's involvement, uh, a combined community effort. Uh, and I'd love to see the region really take a strong leadership role in creating, um, beyond the, the excellent work that went into the uh, regional plan, uh, a strong restoration plan as well based on some of those targets. And, and I think you're going to get community members coming out, uh, involving themselves, and really feeling you know, part of the solution in that regard, and not, you know, defaulting to the despair aspect. So, thanks very much. Thank you, Alan. Um, so through all, we get to go do the, the fun stuff now and, and ask questions. So through all of your presentations, I really couldn't stop thinking about how collaboration was one of the key catalysts in many of these projects um, or partnerships or, or what your organizations do. Um, so our first question is, we would like to know um, what it was that you think made your specific project or partnership, and you could use a different example that you haven't spoke to yet, a success, and what was the catalyst for success? So who wants to start? Yeah, feel free to jump in. We I'll, haven't rehearsed this, obviously. I'll jump in if that's all right. Um, I think this is probably obvious, but the, the, the collaborative nature of what we did here in the region, I think, was huge. And I'd like to tell you a story that I think illustrates that. Um, the night before, one of our municipal partners was bringing their climate plan to council to have it endorsed. That night, they were targeted by a professional climate denier, which is shocking, like 30 years after Karen experienced that. We're still getting that. And so because we had so many resources, we panicked and we put our minds together and we came up with a really effective response to sort of put that fire out as in real time because we had so many resources to draw on. And I am pleased to say the next day, the plan was unanimously endorsed despite the efforts that you know are still challenging us. So I think in our case, the fact that we worked together made a huge, I think it made the impact of our project bigger. It made our dollars go further. It made our voices a little bit louder. And so to me, the collaborative nature of what we did here, I think is unique, uh, at least with municipalities, seven working at the same time on the same project, sharing resources, um, which is a, a really successful model, I think. Thanks. Ian? Yeah, thanks. Um, a couple of things in relation to that question, um, Amanda. I think, you know, for one, uh, Durham Region Council declared a climate emergency and so did most of the local area municipalities. And, and while it's just a statement, it, it, and it provides space politically and administratively to, to explore the art of the possible. Um, and so in relation to that, when I, when I was hired in September, of 2019, the direction from my CAO was relentless implementation. Like, let's not revisit the plans. We, we have the plans and the paper. We need to actually do something about it. And so there is both the political space created by the emergency declaration as well as guidance from the, the, the most senior administrator to like get it done. And so that created the space internally for for us to to know to I guess it you know to think about how how we do this rather than whether rather than whether we do it. And then as well as say that, you know, in terms of external, externally in that external collaboration that I talked about, our, our program, I hope it, it sort of showed that our program design really does rely on collaborative implementation. It's not the municipality and staff trying to do it all. We are sort of sharing roles and responsibilities for implementation in a way that, you know, best suits the capacities of those external partners, like the credit unions, like the nonprofit. Uh, and so it's creating opportunities for them um, you know, business opportunities for them, really, uh, to, to, to generate new business. So there is sort of that win-win side of it that, that, that created an, an openness for uh, collaboration that might not have otherwise been there. That's such a great point. Um, the idea of, like, using the expertise and collaborating where people have expertise as opposed to trying to do it all internally. I love that. Um, Paul Emile, I think you were going to say something next, and then we'll go to yeah, Alan. Um, really interesting question. I think looking at, even in my former role at CCAB, I was the director of business development for four years. So, I mean, back in 2013, we had about 200 members and really we were very resource-based. So, you know, I looked at it like, you know, we have to change as an organization and we have to provide, you know, opportunities in every industry, including renewables, uh, green energy, and, and in turn that creates being more collaborative, um, building more relationships, partnerships, increasing our membership provides more opportunities for each sector. And um, renewables was definitely one I focused on and, and looking at 
uh, you know, building that to a point where now there's more opportunities in, in supply chains uh, for indigenous businesses that, you know, uh, many indigenous communities uh, very could be very remote. So they, they tend to operate where, you know, what the industries are in that particular region. So um, really just, uh, you know, you know, building those uh, partnerships with different organizations and, and allowing them to uh, be more collaborative and open in terms of, uh, you know, building that the supply chain of indigenous businesses. So that's something that, you know, I really focused on the last four or five years. And, you know, obviously now with, with 1,700 members, there's definitely more opportunity and, and definitely more progressive uh, in, our, in our membership makeup. Thank you. Yeah, not much to add uh, other than, I guess, to I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the uh, two huge assets the community has in Brock University and Niagara College and certainly looking at all the stakeholders and, and roles that they play. And Liette Vassour and myself were just chatting briefly before the session today on just our two institutions collaborating a bit more uh, effectively, um, likely more at the grassroots level, I would say. but. You know, the enthusiasm that was on display with the youth uh, panel today, I think, uh, is, a, is a small microcosm of the energy that, ex you know, exists within the students that are eager to learn and contribute in a positive way. So uh, I think of some of the past projects that the college has been involved in through local organizations like the Conservation Authority, uh, you know, like the Land Care Niagara. Uh, they're eager with experiential learning to add, you know, assets to their own resume, but to also be motivated by the positive benefits that they're contributing through that work. So they don't want to read studies. Um, uh, they don't want to necessarily write essays. They do want to get busy and learn by doing. And I, and I do think we've got uh, an incredible asset in this region with those two institutions that uh, need to do uh, better collaboration, I think, among uh, between them but certainly an asset in, in any partnership going forward, for sure. Yeah, I, I can't agree more, Alan. And, and the idea of this experiential education, the feedback we've gotten from our students, they want to be out there in the community feeling like what they're doing is having an impact, so that's amazing. Um, thank you all. You were short and concise, and we, we might get to a third question. Um, the second question we have is we really do want to focus today on the positive and, and what we can do to move forward. And, you know, with moving forward, we also know that there are often challenges um, that we might face. And so with that in mind, we would like to know a bit more about what challenges you've had to overcome um, with some of the projects or, or in your own organizations um, and how you manage through them. Is there anyone who wants to talk about the challenges first? Okay, Ian. Uh, happy to go first on this one. So, I mean, within municipal government, you know, staff capacity is really an ever-present challenge, and that really got exacerbated through the pandemic, of course. Um, and and so that that was that presented a major hiccup. I mean, we did, and I, I'd say we dealt with that through the program design that really limits the role of municipal staff in direct delivery of the program, uh, and sort of engages the partners and, and collaborators to to sort of deliver deliver aspects of the program. So that's one thing which I think I already mentioned. Another part was sort of the novelty of our of our program design with you know third party lending through credit unions and a, and a credit enhancement provided by the region. Uh, that was that was challenging in terms of getting internal buy-in. Uh, you know, municipalities are risk averse for a good reason. Uh, they don't often like to be the first. Um, so we, we overcame this really through a lot of research and benchmarking on other jurisdictions, particularly those in the US that had have sort of implemented these sort of third, third party home energy renovation lending models. And we went even so far as to reach out to them, groups in Connecticut and Michigan, um, to to learn about their experience and even borrow steel uh, program templates like you know uh, agreements and things like that that enabled us to move more quickly in working with uh, with the credit union partners. We did also have some critical challenges in 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 navigating risks associated with our program model. So the FCM funding was is was really limited in terms of our ability to work with the third party lenders. Um, especially when it was announced, uh, as some of you here might know, that uh, the Canadian Mortgage and Housing Corporation uh, will be providing lending, uh, home and greener home loans, I think they're called, uh, which just announced last week. So they're providing 0% interest loans, which of course kind of compete with the credit union lending that we, that we are providing. And so we actually had, had to go and advocate and, and lobby 
the federal government to secure changes to our, our funding agreement. So we worked with our MP, the, the MP for Whitby, um, uh, I guess one of the MPs in the region, as well as um, uh, others to, you know, write letters to cabinet ministers and to senior, senior people in FCM to get changes to our, our, our grant agreement that enabled our, our, our model to work. So I'd say, you know, municipalities need to be advocates as well and, and lobby uh, for change that enables them to act. Uh, and so that's a good example of, of that. And if I may, just finally one point, um, our, you know, the changing economic conditions really were a big challenge. You know, we started in 20, early 2020 and we launched our program in 2022. You know, uh, interest rate environment changed dr dr dramatically from start to finish. And so we had to be flexible with our credit union partners, whereas we initially wanted a fixed rate, low cost lending product. They, by the end, they were they were not having it because of uh, 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 the rising interest rate environment. And so we need to be flexible and ended up moving to a, 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 a variable rate product. So I think flexibility is, is important in terms of those uh, uh, collaborations. I'll stop there. I might have taken up too much space. Thanks. No, that, that, those are all great answers, Ian. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else that wants to speak to challenges? Yeah, there's Alan? like it's a long list, and I could probably list them and use the rest of the time. But I, I think in lots going through my head about challenges that we've we've encountered. I think most of it, it is you know on how do you compel the individual towards a different behavior. Um, and you know even in this room today, we are using terms like adaptation, mitigation, um, nature-based solutions, biodiversity. And I'm not sure that resonates with people. Um, and their their individual effort is going to you know largely I think form the change that's required. So how do you compel people uh, with, with language in ways that resonates with them? You know, at, at our host institution, our home institution, Taryn Wilkinson, a colleague of mine that's here today, at Niagara College, we had to compel the college to change through financial means. So we had to illustrate to them that there was financial benefit, and then we had to prove it to them and. You know, I, I think, you know, the point I made earlier about nature-based solutions, there's lots of really good research out there that for every dollar invested in restoration, you'll get, bet, you'll get back about $10 uh, in, uh, you know, certainly, uh, you know, nature benefits uh, uh, to communities. So there is solid evidence out there, but it's how you compel uh, that change that's needed. And honestly, it, it all results, I think, uh, in... Uh, th there's a great book, Regeneration, by Paul Hawken, and I don't know if you've read, read it or if you haven't put it on your list. It's um, Solving the Climate Crisis in a Single Generation. Uh, and he, he feels that societal change, the individual behavior, has more to do with changing somebody else's behavior than the actual impact itself. And I, and I do feel that that's something from that book that I took, that it doesn't matter that if you, know, you don't feel you're going to have an impact, it's the impact you have on others surrounding you that's really important and that sort of combined community movement will evolve from that. So, you know, those, I think for me, those are a few of the challenges, you know, how to use arguments at key moments based on good science, based on good evidence, but as well modifying, I guess, the communication to, to match the audience so you're compelling that behavior. Yeah, that's such a good point. A, a lot of what I do in our research center at Brock is around knowledge mobilization and knowledge translation, and I'm, I'm constantly trying to convince faculty about how they should be communicating their research, so it makes total sense, yeah. Yeah, I would just add to that. Um, I'm in agreement. I, I think for us, it's the last decade we've had, as an Indigenous organization, um, you know, groundbreaking research that reports on the Indigenous economy. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there, so you know, when we report on the opportunities and challenges of an indigenous business, how they operate in each sector, um, we've really, you know, I think made a lot of strides in, in reporting, um, you know, go from data-driven data research and informing and advocating for good policy to support uh, indigenous businesses. We do that with our membership, the corporate sector, and in government as well. And, you know, how do you, you know, how do you understand what, you know, the needs are of indigenous entrepreneur, the indigenous economy, if you don't have any understanding about that? So, I think really it's been just education and research that has really, you know, uh, provided us with a lot of value in terms of uh, combating those challenges. Thank you. 
Yeah, I agree with all of the challenges raised thus far. Um, and I would just add, uh, with the exception of everyone in this room who is obviously converted, I think there's still a real notion that climate change is a future problem and it always gets bumped down the priority list, you know? So we all experienced this during COVID where there was something more important. And unfortunately, except for those of us that are advocates of just climate everything, it always gets bumped because it's like, we'll deal with it later, we'll deal with it later. And so that is incredibly challenging, uh, you know. But I think the, the flip side, if we spin that in the positive, and we've spoken about it this morning, is COVID showed us how quickly we can change. And I loved Karen's reference to the wartime effort that's required. And we have ex historical examples of rapid, large-scale change that is appropriate to the scale of the challenge. Um, so I think it's just... <laughs> convincing everybody else who's not here or who doesn't see it as an immediate priority that it's not a future problem, it's a now problem. Yeah. I think that's a great note to end on because I can see all the panelists nodding in agreement, Jessica, so thank you. Um, I was going to try and squeeze in one more question, but I think we're going to move to our second panel. I know Alan has to get back to Toronto. Um, and so with that, I want to thank our panelists so much for joining us. We do have some jam as a oh, token of God. thanks. And Ian, we will, we will send you yours in the mail. Um, so thank you so much. And I'm going to ask, we'll give a round of applause and we'll do a switch over. So I'm going to ask um, our next panelist to come up, please. And we're going to connect our other virtual panelists. So just give us one minute. I'm going to get started. Our second panel today is entitled Climate Change Action and the Economy. Um, I'm really excited to introduce you to our second set of panelists um, who are all professionals in the field and who have led the way in terms of climate action, specifically in the field of renewable energy. We're hoping um, that these panelists can help us start to think about the important or the impact, sorry, that looking forward um, towards the future of energy um, can have on the economy right here in Niagara. We were once leaders of energy creation in Niagara. In fact, the Niagara River was the first waterway to be harnessed for hydroelectric power generation. Today, we hope to be able to gain insight from these professionals about how we can make a comeback as a green energy leaders. Again, we will be learning from each panelist about specific projects or partnerships that they've been involved with um, to gain knowledge about possibilities for our own future. So the first panelist I'd like to introduce you to is Nitika Sate, Vice President of Electra Green Energy and Technology Center, the GRN. ENT Center. Um, Nitika is an established thought leader in the areas of clean technology, sustainability, and energy transition. Under her leadership, the GRENT Center has launched many innovative initiatives such as blockchain-based platform that enables the exchange of clean energy between consumers and the grid, North America's first distribution level local and electricity market in collaboration with the independent electric independent electricity system operator and a successful electricity pricing pilot that laid the foundation for a new ultra low electricity rate for the electric vehicle drivers which will become available in Ontario in 2023. So please join me in welcoming Nedeka um, here virtually. Thank you so much. I have to say this is the first time I'm joining a hybrid session. For the past two and a half years, we've got so used to the virtual world where we see each other two dimensionally. And now as we're getting back to um, business as usual uh, with with face-to-face -face interactions, 
Um, this is the first time we have a hybrid, so uh, pretty excited about that. Um, before, um, I, ju I just wanted to make some introductory um, remarks, just so you get familiarized with, uh, with Electra. So if you could move to the next slide, please. And I wanted to leave you with Electra at a glance. Um, Electra Utilities is the second largest municipally owned utility in all of North America. We do serve more than a million customers around the greater Toronto and Hamilton area. And uh, we, we have uh, the utility business on one hand, but we also have an energy solutions and services team uh, that provides innovative energy solutions such as microgrids, energy storage, solar, um, metering and street lighting. So moving over to the next slide, uh, within Electra, as we are facing a world, a, a big generational change in our industry, Electra put together its, um, its uh, innovation, uh, um, innovation hub. Uh, which uh, uh, is is uh, the Green Energy and Technology Center, which we fondly call the Great Center. The mandate at the Great Center is where great minds collaborate to power a better tomorrow, and we make energy innovations come to life. Um, the strategic areas within the Great Center are smart cities, where we have a big focus on e-mobility integration, under grid innovation domain, our focus is on how do we integrate distributed energy resources to make for a smarter and more intelligent um, grid. And then uh, the advanced planning team focuses on market intelligence, um, advanced data analytics, and an integrated end-to-end -end, uh, solution deployment. Um, I have the privilege of, of leading Electra's uh, Great Center, and we just uh, we've just finished three years, and just yesterday we launched our uh, third annual report. So if you have a chance, please go to our website or on our linked page, uh, LinkedIn page, and uh, be sure to catch some of the great initiatives that we have undergone over the past uh, few years. Uh, with that, um, I'd like to pass it uh, over for an introduction to the rest of the panel. Thank you so much. Our next pa uh, panelist who's going to be presenting today is Christopher Penny. Um, Christopher is the manager of hydrogen projects at Atura Power. Christopher has over 12 years of engineering and project management experience in the broad-based energy industry, spanning custom equipment manufacturing, field-based oil and gas operations, can-do nuclear ref refurbishment, and thermal power, and now leading the technical and project management delivery team at Atura Power as the manager of hydrogen projects. Chris is supporting the development of Atura's hydrogen business in alignment with Ontario's first low-carbon hydrogen strategy and supporting the implementation implementation of the Canadian Federal Hydrogen Strategy through Enercan Working Groups. Chris is a graduate of Toronto Metropolitan University with a Bachelor of Engineering in Aerospace Engineering and a Master of Applied Science in Mechanical Engineering. Please welcome Christopher Penny. Okay, good morning. Um, yeah, very excited to be here, the inaugural event. I think this is really exciting and i um, looking forward to sort of introducing Atura Power. I don't expect that uh, many of you will, will maybe know the name, but I'm looking forward to uh, introducing a really exciting, innovative project uh, cited here in Niagara and then looking forward to building the relationship here uh, with the Niagara region um, as we develop, operate that project and I think just broadly uh, walk towards the, the, net, the net zero goals that uh, we have and I think we collectively share in the room. So I'll walk through a little bit here to introduce Atura Power, but really want to focus on sort of the project, um, but then we'll give, again, um, an overview on the, our hydrogen program. I didn't start my five minute timer, so that means introductory remarks don't count against the five minutes. 
So Ontario Power, so one name up on the slide here that I think that uh, you will recognize, Ontario Power Generation. So we are a wholly owned subsidiary. So we, we are relatively new. We're just two years old. Um, and so we are a fleet of combined cycle gas turbine power plants. And so um, we are, we have the four plants all across sort of southwestern to eastern Ontario. And we are the most efficient um, fleet of gas turbines. And so what's interesting is over the last year, we've actually been able to quantify that. So with how we dispatch our plants, we've, we've been able to save about 20,000 tons of uh, carbon emissions by, by being able to leverage the fleet and, and basically load the gas turbines in a certain way to, to reduce the emissions. So I think that one of the sort of... Um, kind of an ethos, I suppose, of, of Atura has been sort of the better than the sum of our parts. And so that's really, I think, been one area that we've been able to, to showcase that. So, um, but just wanted to kind of draw the connection between sort of the base business um, being owned by Ontario Power Generation. And, uh, and so what we are doing and what we're advancing is a low carbon hydrogen production business within Atura Power. So very much looking to move forward and be supportive of on, um, Ontario Power Generation's climate action plan. So a couple of notes on this slide. Um, so the net zero carbon economy by 2015. I don't want to take uh, too much of Paul, your, <laughs> your content here. So we'll, we'll kind of skip over some of that. But the, the point being is we're, we're coupled with their, their targets and what we, what we are doing with respect to hydrogen is acting as a catalyst here in Ontario to then bring heavy emitting industry alongside ourselves on this path to decarbonization and effectively net zero. So what that means is by providing the, the low carbon hydrogen as a fuel and a displacement mechanism in, in other sort of uh, industries. And so um, just seeing if there's anything else relevant here to pull off. Um, we'll just keep going. So I think the... Our strategy is really, um, there's, there's a few components to it um, in terms of what kind of gives us, you know, um, our competitive advantage and a sort of effective uh, value proposition. But with access to Ontario's very low emitting electricity sector, um, I didn't really pause on it on the previous screen, but if you did notice, um, basically 2 3% of Ontario's uh, sort of totalized emissions is attributable to the electricity sector. That competes on the global stage um, with the very best, and in, in most cases wins out from a carbon intensity sort of per kilowatt hour basis. So I think that's, um, uh, I could talk about sort of electricity policy stuff, so we won't, <laughs> that we won't go there, but um, talk to me after and we can, we can unpack it. But um, so, so that's sort of number one, uh, is being, having access to that and leveraging that then looking at the hydrogen hub development. So what we do have um, is five locations. They're all kind of unique locations and it's a sort of um, finding the right, um, you know, sort of coincident supply location with the demand and then limiting sort of that delivery infrastructure piece um, to, to build out an effective uh, hydrogen hub. So this slide here, so this is from the uh, the province's low carbon hydrogen strategy that was released earlier this year. This is our first five projects. And so you can kind of see across southwestern Ontario. Um, I can see I'm already tight on time. So I do want to just jump to the Niagara Hydrogen Center. So this, this project, 20 megawatt uh, electrolysis produced hydrogen. So this is located or intended to be located right off Whirlpool, Whirlpool Road, uh, sort of within on the, the far side of the Sir Adam Beck's Sir Adam Beck complex. So this facility will produce seven tons of green hydrogen. So this is going to be powered directly from the hydroelectric station, just sort of down the canal. And so seven tons of hydrogen. So what does that sort of equate to? So that's, a, that's about 4,000 cars sort of off the highways per year. Um, it equates to two uh, heavy transport trucks. So picture a big 18-wheeler uh, going around, two of them going around the world right around the middle, if you could do that, um, you know, once per day. So it's, it's, a, it's a substantial sort of amount of hydrogen, and it, it relates to an additional uh, 20,000 tons of uh, carbon reduction at our, um, 
our thermal generating station. So this goes to the first use case. There's Halton Hills uh, generating station in Halton Hills. So the hydrogen will be uh, transported to Halton Hills and will be blended um, with that plant. And so that is going to be Ontario's first uh, sort of at scale hydrogen blending uh, in a gas plant. So we're excited to certainly advance the Niagara Hydrogen Center here, but then showcase the technology and opportunity uh, with respect to co-firing in a gas turbine application at Halton Hills. And so as we look beyond um, the first use case of the hydrogen, where else can we use it? And so I think you know, what we look at as our sort of mandate and driver is we want to help to catalyze the hydrogen economy here in Ontario. There's a lot of opportunity, whether it's mobility, whether it's other heavy emitting industries, as I had sort of um, walked through, I think we've had some really good discussions with um, you know, local transit groups, looking at what the opportunity is for fuel cell electric buses, uh, as well as the heavy duty transport trucks, um, chemical companies, steel mills. I think there's, what's really exciting, I think, and maybe I'll just end on this, is that the momentum and interest in decarbonization, net zero, I think we've seen it, lots of, lots of mandates, targets, um, and discussion out there, I think, but what we're, what we're really seeing is at the sort of business development and advancement level, like those discussions are turning into uh, MOUs, they're turning into agreements to really advance uh, the use of hydrogen in places where I think we haven't seen it yet. So exciting to be uh, sort of supporting that and developing uh, the, you know, the low carbon hydrogen to, to advance that opportunity. We'll leave it there. Thanks so much, Chris. I just have to say that all of this is really exciting because I think it was Karen who said transportation is one of the largest emitters that um, municipalities are dealing with. So this idea that it could be used for transportation in the future is, is amazing. Um, our next panelist, Paul Seguin, is the vice president, or sorry, senior vice president, uh, renewable generation at Ontario Power Generation, or OPG. He is accountable for the safe operation of 10,000 megawatts of hydroelectric, thermal, and solar generation in Ontario. Prior to this role, Paul was president of um, Niagara Operations. In his 22 years with OPG, Paul held a wide range of roles in station engineering and operations at the Pickering Generating um, Station, as well as the corporate support for nuclear operations. Paul sits on the board of directors of Water Power Canada and is chair of the board um, for the Peter Sutherland Senior Generating Station Incorporated. Paul holds a BSc in engineering degree in chemical engineering. He previously held Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission licenses for um, the shift manager and duty manager positions at the Pickering Generating Station. Without further ado, Paul. Hey, thanks, Amanda. So, um, uh, th great. Uh, thank you for the introduction. That was quite a mouthful. But what you didn't hear there, I'm, I'm not a I'm not a climate scientist, I'm not a climate expert, uh, and I'm not a municipal uh, uh, official to, 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 to uh, provide or prepare or advocate for municipal policy that way. So really what I am is, is I, I've got experience operating power plants. And, and so I'll, I'll, cut, I'll be able to cut my five minutes probably in about half because uh, Karen in her keynote talked a bit about the, uh, the history of electricity in Niagara, which everybody's familiar with. You know, birthplace of electricity for Ontario. Uh, you see some of the, the facilities that were built uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Uh, and, and really it was, it was facilitating that transition from other means of energy production to electricity. And, and it happened to be that Niagara Falls, being a very attractive place to provide hydropower, uh, that, that was one of the first places we developed in Ontario. Uh, so instead, what I, instead of focusing on that, maybe I'll talk a bit about the present and why. I, I know your opening comments, you talked about how we used to be an, an, an energy leader and how can we become a green energy leader. I'll say, and many of you know this, uh, we have a lot in place right now, a lot of key infrastructure in Niagara that we are using right now to support low carbon electricity production. So, uh, and it starts right across the street from us at DeCue Falls here in St. Catharines. Uh, we have one of the highest capacity factor hydroelectric stations in the province, uh, built in the Second World War, the newer of the two DeCue plants, uh, produces a, approximately electricity for uh, 150,000 homes, and that is producing electricity almost all the time. 
uh, 24-7, uh, 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 365 days a year. Uh, we also have our Sir Adam Beck facility. So the Sir Adam Beck 2 generating station, obviously uh, built and in service in the 1950s, is the largest hydroelectric station in the province of Ontario uh, and, and uh, produces more electricity as a hydroelectric station than any other in the province of Ontario. And Sir Adam Beck 1, celebrating its 100th anniversary this year, continues to supply low carbon electricity, uh, is the third largest uh, hydroelectric station in the province. Um, and uh, pump generating stations. So Niagara is also home to the largest battery in the province of Ontario, the pump generating station, uh, built at the same, same time as uh, the Sir Adam Beck 2 station, uh, provides storage capability. And we're hearing a lot more about storage and the role of storage and how that supports uh, more renewable generation. Uh, this was the, the, the original storage in Ontario in the, in the 1950s, uh, continues to operate today as a means of uh, storing water uh, to, to produce peak electricity uh, uh, when needed. Uh, and, and the future. So, so, so you, heard, uh, you heard my fellow panelists uh, talk about uh, the future of, of alternative fuels and the support that, uh, that the Sir Adam Beck facility is providing in hydrogen and, and how Niagara is going to be a hub uh, for, for the uh, hydrogen economy in Ontario. So that, that's pretty exciting and I think that will hopefully drive some of the discussions this afternoon in, in opportunities to use that. We're going to hear about renewable natural gas as an alternative fuel and, and some ideas around that. Uh, additionally, we're, we're investing in the Sir Adam Beck station. So we, we, this year we're adding two brand new units to the Sir Adam Beck 1 generating station. They're going in service this year. So that's adding about another 100,000, uh, another uh, 100 megawatts so another, uh, electricity for about another 100,000 homes from that station. So new generation, new capacity 100 years after it was built. Uh, and we're investing over the next 20 years, we're investing over a billion dollars to refurbish uh, those stations and, and ensure that they continue to produce low carbon electricity for the next 30 years. So, so uh, a really key piece to, to OPG's plan uh, for uh, for uh, climate change, and, and we'll talk a bit more of that later on. Um, but uh, but but a really important role that Niagara is playing right now in uh, in moving and transitioning to a green a green economy. So, thank you. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, our last speaker for this morning's second panel is Graham Guest. Um, he's the General Manager of Energy and Technical Services at Walker Industries, which is right here in Niagara. Um, Graham has been employed by Walker Environmental Group for 19 years, serving as the General Manager of Energy and Technical Services for the past eight. In this role, Mr. Guest is responsible for the day-to-day -day management of six landfill gas utilization and carbon reduction plants, which total approximately 24 megawatts of renewable energy generation. With a background in project management, he has been the lead project manager on numerous design and build projects uh, dealing with solid waste, biosolids, composting, and municipal infrastructure. Mr. Guest has been active in the re renewable um, natural gas, or RNG, space for the last seven years and is currently completing the development of the first landfill gas to RNG facility in the province of Ontario. Graham, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Should really cut down those bios, I just should say, guy that loves the environment, because, uh, I mean, that's what we're all here to celebrate. And you could say that for uh, each of us, Graham. very <laughs> pleased to uh, be asked to come here today, so thank you very much. Um, so a little bit about Walker Industries, if you don't know, we are a fifth-generation family-run business located here in Niagara, started in the aggregates business and kind of moved into emulsions as, a, I think, a natural extension of that business. But... Um, certainly more recently, since the mid-1970s, we've uh, owned a fairly significant environmental uh, division that uh, does all kinds of things, and um, I mean, I think that's what we're here to talk about today is uh, some of those initiatives. So we have, you know, we're the largest organics processor in Canada. Uh, we process over 700,000 tons of organic waste, uh, turning a lot of that into compost and mulch um, and reusable uh, you know, products that are found across, uh, you know, the horticultural industry and the uh, retail communities. Um, also are one of the uh, first biosolids, uh, you know, repurposing. We always talk about resource management at Walker and how we can take some of the materials that we become stewards of and turn them into something a little more beneficial. 
So we have a <clears throat> number of uh, facilities across Ontario that deal with municipal biosolids. Uh, we blend that with a lime uh, substance to uh, turn it into an agricultural product that displaces chemical fertilizers. Uh, heard a little bit about landfill gas this morning and, and obviously lots of push to reduce the methane uh, outputs and, and we'll see that you know coming up in policy where we're looking at organic spans and uh, I know there's a few people in the crowd involved in the anaerobic digester space so uh, good alignment there on how we're going to manage organics going forward um, and I think most importantly for us today is to discuss this idea of decarbonizing heavy transportation industry with um, you know renewable fuel sources or low carbon intensity sources such as renewable natural gas and um, you know, one of the big projects going on at Walker right now is to take what is essentially the last tranche of landfill gas that we don't utilize for a higher purpose um, and convert that into renewable natural gas. That project will come online in Q2 of 2023. Uh, it's about a 10 megawatt um, equivalent project, so it'll produce enough, elect enough renewable gas to heat about 10,000 homes. It's about the energy uh, consumption of the average home over a year here in Ontario. Um, and it also represents kind of um, our um, best efforts to displace what we think is a, you know, super high emitting uh, fuel and diesel fuel. So if we can convert the diesel fuel fleets into compressed natural gas, then renewable natural gas is just a drop in replacement for that. And you're just moving down the carbon intensity chain um, and really making a significant reduction in the, uh, in the emissions from those vehicles. So um, we're happy to do that. And we're also uh, kind of powering ourselves at this site. Uh, we do use the landfill gas to generate our own electricity. Um, and we've got, we talked about partnerships this morning. We do have uh, some of our partners are here. Um, Tammy's here from General Motors and we've been uh, supplying them with uh, landfill gas and they've been making their own electricity to uh, displace some of the electricity that would come from the provincial grid. So again, just trying to find higher and better uses for some of those materials. So thanks again for having us and uh, I'll give you back a few minutes to get to the panel discussions. Thank you so much, Graham. Um, if you ever get the chance to go for a tour at Walker, it's very interesting, so say yes to that. I was lucky enough to go there a few years ago and they're doing amazing things. Um, so this might be an easy question, an easy first question for all of you, uh, but going back to what Alan was speaking to earlier about, you know, some of us talking about all these concepts and throwing words at you and, and maybe us not all being as familiar as we should be um, with certain topics. Um, we all aren't energy or green energy experts in this room today, and I'd love to know a bit more about what decarbonization really means to each of you. Does anyone want to go first or should I pick a volunteer? Paul, go ahead. What, what does decarbonizing mean to me? So, so, so on a personal level, it, mean, it means an imperative uh, for my children. And, and we talked a bit about, you know, getting people engaged for action rather than looking at, looking, looking at decarbonization as a future problem. And, uh, and while I was never a climate denier, I don't think I felt the imperative until I became a parent, you know, eight years ago. So, so I think there, it was a very personal piece there. From, what what is what, what is uh, decarbonization from from my role in OPG? It's it's looking at ways to support reducing uh, carbon emissions from from fossil fuels for the most part, uh, and and transitioning to to uh, to low carbon. Uh, and, and our role in producing electricity it, it's very focused on on the electricity we generate and how do we transition to to lower carbon electrical generation. Uh, but it also means branching out into other areas supporting electrification. Electrification meaning relying on electricity rather than fossil fuels uh, to support transportation, to support uh, residential, to support industry, all, all the areas that, uh, that was touched on in the keynote. So uh, that, that, that's what I see as, as, as supporting that in, in any way we can. Thank you. Chris. Yeah, so I think that uh, decarbonization is is kind of like a, it's an it's like an end state, but it's also a trajectory. So I mean, we need to sort of walk through that to, to get there. And so I think it's so there's a there's a few components to it, but I think it needs to be sort of effective, efficient, and sustainable. And it's it's all those three things towards the life cycle management of carbon. So I think, and again, not to get too sort of geeky on the details, but there's 
there's a lot of sort of nuances to understanding sort of where something comes from, what's the carbon intensity, how does it get used, and then what's the sort of downstream, you know, component to that. So I think understanding that, and part of it's an education piece, um, but, you know, to be effective, I think um, there's really good remarks by, by Karen, just in terms of sort of that local consideration kind of coming from the community. I, I really do think at like sort of the community municipal level, um, having that sort of ownership and, and managing it um, and sort of pushing some of those priorities is really a really effective means to sort of having that decarbonization be effective. And then sort of efficient is gonna look at what's, what, what's the kind of cost component to that. I think that is still relevant. And then again, sustainable. If in some policy framework something is achievable and so it's efficient, but then that policy framework gets changed, is it still sustainable to keep you below wherever you need to be on some decarbonization curve? So I think you need to kind of, kind of consider all of those things and think, you know, consider the big picture, but, but take those first steps really at that, um, at all levels, but certainly I think it's important to, to reflect on that uh, community and municipal level. Thanks, Chris. Nedika, do you want to jump in, or you don't have to? No, absolutely. This is this is a topic uh, that we are all very passionate about. So, um, decarbonization, the process of reducing amount of carbon um, sent into the atmosphere, the objective to uh, to get to a decarbonize uh, decarbonization is to achieve a low emission global economy to attain climate neutrality, and the way to go it get to it is through energy transition, which means all of us here have an opportunity to be part of the solution, not the part of the problem. Um, especially putting on the lens of a utility, we are the last mile into a customer's home or businesses. And it really, um, we it, it, it puts responsibility on us to ensure that we are able to provide the clean energy choices um, for customers when they are ready to start decarbonizing. For example, it, driving electric, moving and switching fuel from fossil fuel into clean electricity can take care of a lot of um, uh, the climate change issues that we have. But for that, um, the, the electricity sector, very specifically the distribution sector, we need to be ready to empower the gas pumps of tomorrow that are going to be um, located inside a customer's home. So for us, decarbonization is a huge opportunity to reinvent ourselves, to make ourselves relevant for the customers in a whole brand new way, and uh, to really transform the sector um, in, in a way that hasn't been done for centuries. Those are all really good points. Graham, did you want to add anything to this? You don't feel, you don't feel like you have to answer, but if you'd like to. Yeah, no, no. Um, <laughs> you know, I think f for, for many people, certainly for myself, the, the first part of decarbonization is, is an education piece because I don't know how many people, maybe even outside of this room and maybe some people even in the room, um, could tell you kind of what their active carbon footprint is um, in the businesses that they're involved with or even in their own life in terms of travel and uh, things of that nature. And so for me, it's an education piece. Um, you know, we want to try and measure um, that carbon footprint so that we can kind of actively manage it through whatever efforts that might be, fuel switching. Maybe it's uh, just being... Um, more responsible with some of the resources that we have. Uh, you know, we've got a Leeds building uh, on our site that uh, is, you know, has no water, captures all the water from the atmosphere, and we use that to uh, maintain the facility and to flush toilets and to, you know, just do things like that. And it's, I think it's small ones like that that help everybody understand, you know, if you can make these incremental impacts, um, then they will all add up and, and really start to move the dial on this stuff. And I guess the, the other piece is maybe a little bit about policy. Um, I think there needs to be policies that drive options for people. Um, on the utility scale, you know, whether it's uh, renewable electricity or whether it's renewable natural gas, we want the policy to support options so that the consumers have a choice to make uh, when it comes to procuring energy for themselves or for their businesses, and they can choose a low carbon option. Um, and, and there's, you know, policy behind it that'll help you know, make those choices a little more obvious 
um, and a little more um, kind of urgent. Yeah, it's all it's also true. Um, that was great. Uh, so the second question we have for all of you is, um, I, don't, I know personally, I'd really like to hear more about what you all think are the keys to success um, for energy transition. So for example, is it regulation? Um, is it partnerships? Is it funding? Is it government policy? It's probably all of the above. But I guess um, just to, for all of our leaders here today, what do you see as one of the most important keys to success? Maybe the answer is going to be different for all of you. I don't know. I'll start again. Okay, sure. go ahead, Paul. Uh, so, so um, I, I like what you said about all of the above. So I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of go there. <laughs> so, so uh, I was at an industry event for for water power. I, it was a, a, a Canadian water power industry event uh, a couple weeks ago. Uh, so there were leaders uh, from uh, utilities. Uh, but we also had federal policymakers there, and 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 one of the things that they were asking us as 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 industry leaders is is you know looking at pumped storage, which we talked about being important, looking at new hydro development, looking at redevelopment or improved efficiency at hydro, existing hydro, where, where should we prioritize? And, and, and that conversation went on for a bit until somebody interjected and, and it really hit home is, you know, we can't afford to prioritize. We have to do all of the above. And, and I think that when it comes to policy that's focused on specific aspects, uh, we need to we need to be looking at more than just specific aspects. We have to consider all all options and be be progressing all options because of the urgency that we're facing. Uh, that that that's that's key for us. Uh, partnerships uh, again, uh, we need to look at all opportunity for partnership. We've had a lot of rewarding partnerships with communities, municipalities, and, and indigenous communies. Uh, in, in Ontario power generation, and we need to look for opportunities uh, as well. But again, it's not a, a one-item uh, focus. It's it's uh, we need to be doing it all, and we need to be doing it now. So that's a great point. I think it goes back to what our youth um, panel said this morning too. Like it needs to happen now. It can't be one priority at a time. I like that, Chris. I liked Paul's all of the above, but uh, <laughs> I'll I'll pick on one, and I'll say I think I think policy is important, and I think policy with a timeline that extends beyond sort of an incumbent's uh, term. I think we can't go back to the well every two, four years, whatever, and sort of reset on what, our, what we're going to do and, and how we're going to do it. So I think, and that's important going back to sort of sustainable decarbonization. How do you build a framework that then you can then continue to build on and you, you don't have to go back and, you know, redraft it. So I think that's really important, and I think, um, so yeah, good comments on, I think, having sort of optionality and, and so sort of more of an, ag an agnostic perspective on, on within the policy framework on how to sort of get there and, and let, you know, a, a number of things, you know, industry um, sort of forces um, competition sort of help move through that. Um, and I think maybe just lastly, I think, you, you know, you don't want to have sort of perfect stand in the way of the good. So in this, the standpoint of, okay, like let's make some steps forward that like we, everyone wants to, and, and engineers are, are the worst and I'm one, so I can say that, but we wanna wait till we have something that's just, you know, super perfect. And that's, that's noble, but I think we have to show progress. And so I think really from, you know, sort of the technical perspective, but also from the, within the political landscape, have to take that view that, um, you know, action is important and, and inaction while waiting for a perfect plan is, is, is not better. I'm smiling because I work with faculty every day that this is a challenge we have about the perfection piece. So, um, Netika, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I just wanted to throw in the perspective that you've got to be able to have the pushes and pulls working in alignment. Um, the, the pull will come from the customers when the awareness is there. So we're not there yet. Um, I, I'd like if I could see a show of hands, like how many of you people are still using, um, you know, uh, plastic water bottles at home? How many of you are still, still uh, uh, utilizing resources like we have five planets? And I, I, I'm guilty of that too. So the the awareness as the awareness builds up and as the uh, citizens start changing their behaviors there'll be a huge pull for for um, uh, you know because because end of the day businesses follow money so 
customers are paying and whatever the customers want as choices, those will, uh, will be honored. On the other hand, the push comes from policy. So if, if, the, if the government wants to nudge people in a certain direction, that push has to come by way of long-term, well-formulated, well-understood, well-articulated policies. Look at Norway. Why do they have such a high penetration of electric vehicles? It's, it's not because EVs, it's not because uh, the customers were aware of EVs uh, on their own. It really was a big push from, from governmental policy perspective. So um, uh, the third aspect is also investors because the money comes from investors as well. And as we see more and more investors putting down their foot on ESG and sustainability is a big piece of it. So we are, we are already beginning to see good amount of alignment. Where I'd like to see more work is the alignment between the government and the regulators. So we do need more market forces to be in place, whether it is for carbon accounting, the carrot and the stick. Like, why don't you see um, more solar in Ontario today? Why don't you see, why is it not easy for you to go and pick up an electric vehicle from a dealership? Because they ain't any electric vehicles. The EVs are all going to other uh, provinces or jurisdictions where they have a ZEV mandate, where having a healthy supply of, of uh, electric vehicles is, is, uh, is mandated. So uh, the, having the policies in place such that the market forces can be flourished is really, really important at this point. For that, you're going to need a close working, um, close alignment between the government uh, giving directives to the regulators so that um, so that a local energy market local energy transition market can can be opened up thank you so much so i see yours is a, an all of the above type strategy too which is great <laughs> um graham did you have anything you wanted to add to that uh, maybe just to reinforce, uh, you know, my opinion that I think strong partnerships are going to help us kind of pave the way. Obviously, like nobody can do it by themselves. Um, we need strong partners with industry that are willing to take leaps. We need strong partners at the government that are willing to provide funds to move some of these projects across the line because, you know, we're in a little bit of a, a nascent market when it comes to green energy. And, and as we begin to make that transition, Businesses need to revisit, you know, what their hurdle rates are for these things and how important, you know, is it more important to make uh, the return uh, that the shareholders are expecting or is it more important to kind of do the right thing? And there's, uh, there's always a bit of a tug of war there, um, particularly as you, um, you know, see emerging technologies come on that you might want to take advantage of and you got to take a bit of a leap on. And so, you know, from technology partners to business partners to the financial community to the government uh, programs uh, to, to industry, I just think there's a real need to remain collaborative and open um, to finding solutions so that we can kind of, you know, get these projects done, prove that they work, and start to reduce the anxiety that comes from change. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I love the role that education has obviously played in today too, and, and that's come up several times, and that makes me really proud as someone who works in the post-secondary um, sector. Uh, so I think we're going to, I'm going to take liberty here, and we're going to have one more question just because I, I, I want a few more answers, if that's okay. Um, and I'm sticking right on time, and you all have done great with your presentation times. Um, so as a final kind of wrap up and, and a way to end um, positively, what do you see as the most exciting opportunity for our future as green energy leaders and the future of local energy generation here in Niagara? We're both going to say hydrogen. They're going to say the hydrogen say? plant. <laughs> Yeah, I think there's lots to be excited about. Um, I think events like this is, uh, are exciting, and I think um, the, the partnerships and business connections, I think, that can come and just sort of the overall momentum. Um, I think opportunity to, you know, nascent market, hydrogen is certainly fits into that definition. So I think that's an exciting opportunity, and I think certainly Atura Power has, you know, a, a, bit, a, you know, a very um, ambitious goal and, and target in terms of production and what that looks like to get towards that uh, net zero economy at 2050. So I think that's exciting. And um, you said positive, so I don't want to put on sort of the black hat, but 
I think, you know, both Jessica and Karen kind of, you know, circled this one, and it's just like, so, so we're kind of coming out of the pandemic. We've seen what uh, sort of a, a very heightened response looks like in terms of the impact to our day-to-day -day lives, and sort of maybe it's kind of a challenge or something just to sort of think on, but if climate change is an emergency, and, and there's so, so that, and I think that's a true statement, at the same scale, are we willing to take the same impact to our day-to-day -day lives and sort of impacts that way to address climate change? I think these events are good, the discussion's good, I think there's momentum, but just sort of you know, reflecting on that, we've seen what the certain steps look like in terms of impact to our lives to, to, to sort of you know, stem, stem the tide on a very different event, but with, if, if you reflect on climate change, sort of would you be willing to take the same impact on your, on your life to then address climate change? So anyways, I don't know if that's positive, but it's just something to I think kind sure. of think about. <laughs> Paul? Well, on your, la on your last point, that you're really talking about that, that imperative to act, that sense of urgency, right? And, and so the positive I'm gonna take away is just this, this today, right? Uh, have, see, seeing the leadership in this room, hearing from the youth uh, on, on, on the youth panel, I think uh, really, really inspires me in terms of the energy that we have behind getting people to see the imperative of, of, the, uh, of the need for action. So, so I'm really excited to continue this discussion this afternoon. And thanks. Thanks. Netika or Graham, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I can. I, I, I fully agree with my uh, fellow panelists. I think it's the power of partnership that is is going to be the most um, impactful. And um, there is there is a lot of good work happening um, uh, within the Niagara region that can be replicated, uh, and others in other regions can learn and collaborate. Um, so that that's that's a huge opportunity. Thanks so much. Graham, do you want the last word? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I would say I'm super excited that we're, you know, taking advantage of some of the things that are what I would call low-hanging fruit, right? Like we can produce green hydrogen. We can produce renewable natural gas. We can create ultra-low CI electricity. And we can deliver that to almost anyone now. And so all of these things exist and people are taking steps and people are making investments and policy is changing. And so I think while we're still in the early stages of this thing, I feel there's some momentum growing for it. And so that's, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about what the future looks like. And I think, um, you know, opportunities to sit down and have these kinds of conversations is only gonna drive that point forward and keep that momentum going. Yeah, and you make a really good point that the technology is there, and now it's that human push. It's is what we talk about on a daily basis in our center. How do we actually, you know, be the catalyst for those changes? And all of you sitting here today could be part of that. So that's amazing. Um, I can't thank you all enough, Netika. Thank you so much for joining us. We do have small gifts for all of you that Suzanne is going to run around, and Netika, we will send you yours in the mail. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. You're hired. You did an amazing job. You handled the hybrid perfectly. And you kept us on time. So I'm shocked. Um, and thank you to all the panelists. You have provided us with hope, with encouragement, and ideas around innovative approaches to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and implement climate action in our community. So I'm very thankful for having you all here today to support our summit and event. This now ends the live stream portion of our event. So we would like to say bye and thank you to all of our live stream uh, participants. The live stream portion was also recorded so this will be available to all to send, to rewatch, to uh, get that reignited inspiration if you need it um, at a later time. We're now going to move into our lunch. We have a one hour lunch break. 
Lunch is available upstairs. You can take the stairs or there's an elevator available outside of the main doors. As well, we invite you to eat outside on our patio, at your tables, or upstairs, wherever you prefer. So thank you so much, and I'll call you back when we're ready. Thanks. Mm -hmm.